All right, I'll grab them. All right, and then describe right. what the crab is and why it's important for the environment. Um, th this crab is important because it eats algae. Yes. And there are many, many algae, types of algae that ruin our oceans. Thank and you. Yeah. <laughs> so they're balanced. Balanced. Well, they're, listen, yeah, they're, they're balanced. There's some, some good some algae. Some are good. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's about it. But good science, my friend. This the is, next generation, ladies and this, gentlemen. This is your friend. <laughs> you tell Dennis that this is not a stone crab because he was trying to eat I them. I thought you were there. bringing the stone crabs. So you said you're bringing crabs. I was like, I yeah, good. I'm hungry. I'm not too much. This thing show look, at it, look at his mouth. It like opens. Yeah. He's saying. <laughs> table i think it was um the, the one that won the big rock that singularish caught we still have it out here um i have to do an extra special painting um, north carolina uh, yeah big old bowl yeah bigger than 72 74 won all the money but when they pulled it in it's a skinny yeah it was it was kind of comes... emaciated you know for a fish that size they was they weighed in at 68 pounds um but i it could have been bigger you know, than that, it wasn't a it wasn't a mahi tournament too. It was no, a it was a marlin tournament. So totally incidental. Big old fish. Yep. Big fish. What did yeah. it eat? Up in North Carolina. It ate a jay boy. Right. Oh, it ate a moisey. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Caught that on Andy. One of Andy's lures. Well, I mean, yeah. And it's good. Andy. Andy's. There's no one that we 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 were actually talking yesterday about uh, lures. Uh, I had lunch with Andy, mm -hmm. and uh, he talked about lures having souls. And the amount of time that someone puts into it, it's almost like art, right? If yeah, you, the more right. the more you put into to it, and we talked about, and I don't want to knock a specific lure company, but it used to be one of the greatest lure companies and one of the legends, and that that company has somewhat become, those lures have somewhat become soulless. Uh, they're mass produced. They're they the time, the love, the 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 clear caring about the quality, the craftsmanship has gone down. Um, and that's what really makes a great lure is someone that spends the time and cares and the yeah. energy to really make yeah. it right. You but can so, say that about a lot of companies too. Yeah. Like, you know, how they just, that's why I think it's important to recognize the companies over time, over the decades, over the centuries in some cases, that keep to their core and the way they've always done it since day one. You know, and that's why those companies are so important. There's gotta be, there's gotta be science it's a little country and a little rock and roll. Yeah. If they still love it, but they've also been learning from their mistakes and getting better and better and better. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the, I, th I love that this fish still ate something. It's a huge fish. It's not starving. It's just old and rickety. Yeah. Which means it's survived a long time. It's been eating the right stuff. And maybe there's maybe maybe there was something magic about that lure that it attracted it over other stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's an old alive fish still eating. That's good in this day and age. There yeah. might not be that many monsters out there, but there's still some monsters out there, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. So I'll, I want to officially um, introduce everybody here and, and say thank you for coming out and giving us your um, your time, your valued time. Um, all three of you here, all four of you at the table, because we got an extra one over guy. here, right? We got we got little Johnny too. Um, so we got Miles Foreman and uh, John Lose, right, and Dr. Charlie Gregory and uh, Johnny Junior. Johnny the Fourth, right? Johnny the Johnny Fourth. Johnny the Fourth. Oh, El Quattro. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? You wanna say hi to everybody? Good. Yeah, hey good. guys. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Um, so, welcome to Connected by Water, presented by Joey Cardi Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Um, and I'm very happy that you guys are in this room. And I am. Uh, we're in the presence of uh, some intelligent minds here, and some very hardworking people that make a real, true difference in our community. Uh, one of them is going to be bartender today. It's Miles Foreman. So Ready. you're officially going to be our bartender. And um, we got John here. Um, how do you want to introduce yourself, John? I can introduce you in 27 different ways because you <laughs> I, you guys are all Renaissance men here at the table, right? Yeah. Uh, a behind-the-scenes guy. Behind-the-scenes guy. And I got Dr. Charlie Gregory. You guys are intelligent minds, but one more so uh, 
Yes. This, this one over here is the smartest guy in the room. There's on no paper, doubt about it. On paper. Yeah. Um, no, he's so. a rock star. He's a rock star. He's a uh, a uh, fish scientist, a marine veterinarian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, you know more about fish than you know, I thought I knew fish until I started reading up on on some of your stuff. But there's different uh, there's different types of knowledge. I get the nerd side pretty good, mm -hmm. and I can keep them alive in a big fish tank, gotcha. small fish tank even. Gotcha. Um, I love to defer to the wisdom of the ages. There's people way better than me at keeping fish alive in a lot of different ways and people way better than me at knowing about fish, mm -hmm. especially certain fish. Yeah. Veterinarians are very broad. Mm -hmm. um, they're specialists, scientists, PhDs. It's a little different than a, a veterinarian. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, I hope I know what I'm talking about and can keep up with the, with the fishermen and with the aquarists and with the aquaculture guys enough to be able to keep their fish alive. Yeah, well, nice. You do have a doctorate. Uh, yeah. In, in aquatic fish sciences, right? I was in school a long time, but yeah. I like school, man. <laughs> yeah. Don't graduate and celebrate. I like school, too. He, he, he's underselling himself, just yeah. so you know. Nice, nice. And, Miles, um, you are somewhat of a uh, mega man in my mind. I, I guess probably the really good way to kind of describe Miles as mega man because you were just a man of many things as well, and you were just, um, you know, I extremely well-cultured and learned and um, just, you know, intelligent in a lot of ways, a lot of lot of um, experiences that you've had um, in the world in your lifetime. Um, the contributions you've made um, are immense. Um, Thanks. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just, you know, say that. Um, so we really appreciate everyone coming in. And a guy whose family has been a pioneering family. I mean, yeah, been absolutely. here since 1908. I mean, it, 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 you're, it's hard pressed to find uh, many. Yeah, 1903. 1903, sorry. Yeah, nice oh, family. You got, you got your double circles wrong. Yeah. So it's hard to find some, you know, uh, you know, a, a pioneering uh, family still here that's been here since that day uh, mm -hmm. that cares. Uh, that's obviously why he cares so much or one of the reasons he cares so much is he, his family has been here through all the changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, oh. it's really, it's really wild to look at old family photographs and see, you know, all the kids, the grandmoms, the moms with massive water moccasins at their feet, and yeah, alligators wow. at their feet. And I mean, you live in South Florida, you can see for yourself, like, how would you even make it down here? I mean, that's back in, like, nothing. the Stranahan Flagler days and yes. all that, right? I mean, yes. that, that's that's historical stuff. See, I, I am just completely enamored by the history of this state. Because I always, I mean, we've mentioned it on the show, you know, again, John's probably going to be like, stop talking about that so much. But just how, like, Florida is, like, the last frontier, I think, of the United States of America. Like, it seems like every other place got settled before the first place that was ever discovered. The, the, Seminole, you, you know I mean? the Seminole Indians and the Miccosukee were the only Indians that never surrendered to the U.S. government because they right. came. The, the U.S. government did not want to come down to the swamp and mm -hmm. fight the Indians. Well, that's the thing. It, was, it wasn't really a formidable land. You, yeah. know, they, you know, they got the gators, they got the mosquitoes, you got no air conditioning. I think the guy that invented air conditioning came from Florida. The statues yeah. in the, in the <laughs> Capitol building. We have a statue building. of yeah. the guy who invented air conditioning. <laughs> right. I mean, the, there's a reason that no one came down here. And, you know, once the AC kind of came into play, everyone's like, oh, we can go down there now. But <laughs> it's still a barren wasteland in the middle. It's still it's intimidating. Still yes. You yeah. get stuck out there, you're in trouble. You can go back in time. You can drive 45 minutes from the studio and be in the middle of nowhere in the swamp, just yeah. like it was. And the panhandle of Florida, that was settled much earlier. Mm -hmm. you know, and they were still trying to figure out exactly what that was a part of. But it was quite some time until uh, South Florida, where we are, was inhabited. Right. Yeah. Yep. Except by, yeah, some... Handful of people like your family. Yeah, handful of people. Strand hands. Yeah, um, that's why people wonder, oh, why is the capital up in Tallahassee? You know, that's pretty much why, you know, because technically, yeah. it really, people think it should be Orlando, but, you know, this is why it's Tallahassee. Definitely shouldn't be Orlando. Well, yeah. some people say that just because it's centrally located, and it's, yeah. a, it's a huge, it's a huge... Uh, and it was, it was a big bootlegging uh, area, too. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the... Um, What's the the concrete ship, right? That used to be a bootleg mm -hmm. spot. You know, the Bahamas, a lot of yep. the bootlegging came well, through that's where South her, Florida. Uh, Real McCoy term came from. Yeah. Right? So McCoy was the big rum runner. Yep. yep. Back and forth so from Fort Lauderdale to the Bahamas and then to Central Florida, North Carolina. What's it? It's called the Sidonia, the... Uh, the the name Sapon of Saponia, the concrete Saponia. ship. The Saponia. Right. Okay. Saponia. That yeah. was like so that, a story. That's where that term, the Real McCoy, comes from, though. 
Yeah, right. and just say, oh, the, all the knockoff during the Prohibition, all the knockoff rums, but McCoy was bringing it over from the Bahamas. It was actually real rum to go, oh, that's the real McCoy. And an that's interesting, where the term came from. Uh, an interesting yeah. story of the Saponia, as it was a bootlegging spot where they hid the liquor before they brought it over, mm-hmm. it was also at one point used by, in World War II, used by uh, the U.S. military as a bombing bay, as, mm-hmm. a, as a bombing target. And uh, Foreman Field uh, was a naval base that uh, Miles' great-grandfather, grandfather, donated to yeah. the U.S. government? Well, no, they they uh, let them use it. It was a part of our uh, palm nursery and dairy. Right now, uh, Broward College sits on that very property. Really? Yeah. And it's, where, which where, one, where, the NSU campus? Or all the of them. Um, the, yeah, well, BBC sits directly on where the field was, and then you have NSU as well. At the Davy campus. At the, the Davy campus. Yeah. okay. So the pyramid that you see when you're driving mm-hmm. on 595? Yeah. Okay. That was the Dude, I'm glad you're telling me this because my, my kids ask me that all the time, and I'm, I don't, really don't know what they That answer. was my father's marketing thesis project in college. Really? Yeah. So and what is it? Well, let me explain. that. that was uh, – <laughs> so that was our palm nursery and dairy. Mm-hmm. We owned that entire swath. And uh, when John's dad and my dad were – I guess in their late twenties or something, um, they got into the cemetery business, and they decided to. Uh, Everyone's dying to get in. Huh? No, sorry, bad bad cemetery joke. Everyone's dying to get in. Yeah. Everyone's dying to get in. <laughs> and my grandfather Hamilton, um, he was a very simple man. I, I, I he was kind of like Indiana Jones because he traveled the world and immersed himself in tons of cultures and brought back lots of. Treasure hunting oddities that he would bring back, and of course I did that with him throughout my whole life when I was able old enough. So, you know, he was a very simple guy, and he really wanted to bring education down to South Florida, like collegiate education, real education, as you were. Um, and so he donated that land to uh, Nova and Broward, really, which my dad. Uh, and John's dad were like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> and that really is what like ignited the spark in their entrepreneurship. And I, you know, suppose they decided to, uh, you know, build a cemetery as part of their, uh, or sorry, a pyramid mm-hmm. as part of the cemetery. How do you market death? And pyramid. so, yeah. <laughs> and so, well, that's the best place to be buried. <laughs> and so when I talk to my dad, I run ideas by him because we have a really good relationship. We still talk and I take his advice. And sometimes when I get jammed up, you know, I, a lot of my ideas are out of the box. And, and I go, so you're telling me no. You're telling me this is coming from the guy who was like... Let's build the pyramid, man. Yeah. Let's build the pyramid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so real, real quick thing. Real quick thing. I want to leave leave on the uh, the the field because the the air the airstrip is that is where the strip of the Bermuda Triangle started from. It was, they took off from Foreman Field. The the Navy officers mm-hmm. w- went to bomb the concrete ship yep. that started the missing fleet. That uh, they all took off from Foreman Field. Wow. That was the Bermuda Triangle, the where they were the guys that went missing, the, the, yeah. the squadron that went missing. I'm gonna have to interrupt everyone here for. Could you hand me that bottle of rum? Sure. Over there, that bottle of Papa's Pilar. This here. one here. Yep, that one there, the one that's open. And uh, you want some rum over there? Can Got I give it? Yeah. Can I give it a quick whiff? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You're because you're never a spectator. That's why. Yum, <laughs> yum. It's got that nice vanilla. Yeah, it's really fantastic stuff, and I'll be the good host here. You want to go? Uh, Your gentleman, oh, sure. I believe I've had this before. It's quite nice. So, anyone Perfect. want any? Uh, it's a great room. Yeah, mixers got yeah. rocks. If yeah. people want, rocks. it's a great company too. Absolutely, and I'll have some myself. I, I know uh, Eric Lear, who's part of that company, and he's a great guy. And uh, I, I, he's I, I got to taste it and get some of his specialty drinks he makes from it. And, yeah, yeah, nice. Uh, Great group, great, great rum, great group of people. You know. It's easy to drink. Yeah. Am I sleeping on your couch? Is this how we're going down? Well, we got a couch right here behind us. Really? So if, if he's you, got if some coke he's going to share with you. So one of the things I kind of want to lead into here is that, um, John, you want a rum? Uh, no, I'm all right. No, you're good? All right. He looks dehydrated. Poor guy. Yeah, poor guy. He looks like the fish over there, the, the mahi. The, yeah. The yeah. <laughs> um, 
is that, you know, it, it, it's obvious that uh, you guys have deep, deep roots here um, in Florida, like we all do here. Um, and we also have, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, the Rome runners and going across. Cheers. And cheers, guys. Thank you again for coming in. Cheers. And um, Johnny, you want cheers you know, with your you Coke? G- <laughs> <laughs> all right. You guys also have uh, some pretty nice solid roots nice. over there in the Bahamas. Yes. Right. And as um, we're going to get into today and explain to people um, who you really are, not just on the surface of your introductions, but who you are, guys, um, below the layers and beneath the layers and deep down who you are, um, and the good that you guys do. And um, from a philanthropy pr- perspective, but also just 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 generally, it's just outwardly helping out to the Thank community. You. Um, you also do these things um, across the pond, shall we, across our pond. Um, over in the Bahamas, where you guys have a lot of very solid um, foundations as well, um, particularly in the assistance of some of the things that you did for the Abacos uh, from Hurricane Dorian, um, which we also um, were had a huge hand in helping out uh, with some of the things over there. So anytime I talk to anyone who uh, was involved, like you guys were, um, in the assistance, um, you know, after the storm, uh, it really kind of touches me deep in the heart. So I, I'd like you guys to kind of get into a little bit of some of the things that maybe if you want to start off like talking about like some of your background over there in the Bahamas and how you guys have such deep foundations or, or solid foundations and, and maybe, you know, take us through some of the things that happened during the course of events, if you would. Well, um, I'm going to start off by saying, you know, I grew up fishing around the canals. Via Vista. I learned from uh, Andy Moyes, who was a good friend of mine, mm-hmm. and he didn't need to teach us. And he was 15, 16. We were 9, 10, and he taught us how to throw a cast net, all that. And he's a Bahamian. If most people don't realize that, that he's actually uh, a Bahamian. Uh, yep. Just like a lot of people don't realize that uh, Tiny has Jamaican roots. Yep. Um, so uh, the Abacos have always been a special place in the Bimini and, and all those places. And when people, uh, when we saw the destruction happening and we were getting live footage, the first thing I did was worry about like my direct friends that were in, in the Abacos. Um, I worried about them first. Yeah. And for sure. I was all over social media trying to locate them to see if they were alive, um, and get some type of communication from them. And so I put it all out there but all the cell towers were down. There was only one cell tower that survived. Mm-hmm. So the communication was very tough. And they got it up on a generator, I think, at some point, And communication came through. Um, and we could only talk at, like, 1 in the morning because other, other than that, the, there just wasn't broadband enough broadband mm-hmm. to handle the type of communication going through one cell tower. Now, when, when in the timeline of events, when are you speaking of specifically? I mean, within a day after the storm, storm. I was trying to get to find them. Yeah. And then I got a hold of them maybe three days after the storm. I got a a WhatsApp message in the middle of the night that they were alive. Um, And I said, okay, well, I'm coming to get you. We're coming to get you. Uh, And I was, uh, at first I was thinking we were coming to rescue this a family, about seven people, um, and bring them back or get them out of there because it was it was beyond what you can imagine. Even even after a mile and Miles went on the trip with me, uh, so so we decided to load up. I had I have a forty three Viking. We loaded it up with as much fuel as we could. We loaded it up with uh, chainsaws and skill saws and tarps and everything we could possibly think of. We way overloaded it. What probably wasn't the smartest decision, how much weight we so put on So you guys are board. basically, you know, abandoning caution and just, you, this is shortly, very hours after the, after the destruction. I know how I felt when I saw that thing stall on Grand Bahama and just, just was not moving, right, on Labor yeah, Day. This right? would have been, let's say, if the worst of the storm happened on Monday, we left Thursday morning. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I... I had talked to John about this as the storm was hitting over the weekend. Remember, you were at my house, and we were calling different people to ask, you know, what we should do and who could come with us. And mm-hmm. and we had talked about it, and he said, I'll get back to you, I'll get back to you, and I didn't hear back from him. And uh, it's Wednesday night. I'm watching the uh, Chappelle Netflix special had just come out. 
been I drank probably about like half a bottle of wine at that point. It was like after ten o'clock, and uh, Captain John Stevens, who I'm sure you know, calls me up and goes, "Miles, John's going tomorrow morning, and it's just me and him, and uh, I need you to uh, come with us. Like you got it." And you're and you're drinking wine, so you said yes. Watching Dave Chappelle, well, <laughs> and, and, I, think, I think you wanted him to talk me out of going. But Miles was kind of like, there's once John's mind's made up, there's not much yeah. talking him out of it. Yeah. And Ed Colson also was going. That's right, yeah. Ed. I, Ed. I, I knew when I had said just you and him that I remember. Oh, yeah. Who's, Ed was Ed's going. also a Bahamian. But only the three of them were going, and there were certain provisions uh, that uh, Stevens wanted me to bring and some of my knowledge and just be a part of the team. So I leap up, and I, I was at a friend's house. I go home. I go in my bedroom. My wife's already asleep. I start packing a duffel bag. I'm like, I'm leaving, going to the Bahamas tomorrow. I got to do this. She's like, what's going on? <laughs> I'm like, I got to go. I'm like, it's uh, it's important. And, uh, yeah. Like, so and you're basically was, ignoring was, anything from the Bahamian yeah. government at the time, right? Or, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were t- we were told not to go Yeah. because um, they didn't want uh, – people to create a, a bigger problem right. and have There's to no rest fuel over there. There was no fuel. We, we, but no one knew that we knew really? there was no fuel. Did you know that? Okay. Um, we, we put, we put, um, two, 275 gallon tote containers mm-hmm. in the back of the boat. Okay. <laughs> Which was the, the Viking carry 600 gallons of fuel. We had another, whatever, 550 uh, mm-hmm. in the back. But we had to, we didn't get a full 550 in there because the tuna door. We took it all the way to the point where the water was coming in the t- just before the water would come in the tuna door. So we took it all the way. To the, everything was to where we would have sunk, pretty much. It yeah. was it was. Um, and then we knew we had to go the the long way through the Northwest Providence Channel because of all the debris in the water. Um, wow. We knew that we had to go the longer deep water route. Right. Because normally we would, we would go west end, come across the bank, but mm-hmm. there was just too much debris and too much danger. The shoals had moved because of the storm. We didn't know what we were dealing with, so we took the long way. So take me through a little bit of when you first got there, what you saw. Our goal was to get there before dark. So we left early, and it was a really long trip because mm-hmm. I, I, I had a, you know, I knew we were going to be slower, but I didn't think we would be as slow as we were. And there was another boat that went with, with us. Uh, Robert Roshman had an Intrepid, and he had some people um, uh, from the federal government, I guess mm-hmm. I could say, that were with him um, that wanted to get over there because they were they needed to get there and mm-hmm. set up a, a central command over there. And they were going to follow us and they were just like, Johnny, your speed's too slow. And he's like, dude, they, you know, we're talking on the radio and he's like, your boat's like swaying mm-hmm. from the weight, you know? And it took us a long time. 14 it, hours. 14 hours to get there. Wow. Yeah. And we had to go to the deep water. So we're fighting the, so we're fighting yeah. the current, you know, we're coming around hole in the wall as we're coming around hole in the wall. The, the cool thing about it is we saw all the Spanish wall, crab boats or, or, mm. or, or lobster boats and as we're coming around the corner all you could see was all these little tiny lobster boats from the Spanish Wells boys mm-hmm. and, and women that went to go help their their fellow Ab- I don't know if Spanish Wells is considered Abacos uh, uh, Eleuthera I think yeah so it, it, it was but it's right across hole in the wall if you look at yeah. uh, on a chart and so we saw the Spanish Wells boys coming in their little boats trying to help with whatever they could we're coming around the corner, and there was just like helicopters and navy ships. It was like Dutch ships and British ships, and it was like it was unbelievable. And and it was like we f- you felt like you were in in uh, a war zone because there were helicopters flying right over your head. You know, like war helicopters, Blackhawks, Blackhawks, Navy Blackhawks. Yeah. I've never seen a gray, yeah, the gray painted. You know, Navy Blackhawk. Mm-hmm. And so we we were seeing these. You know, we. It, we were just kind of freaked out. It was just like a holy shit, what's going on? Sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that, but yeah, it, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was sketchy. That's your call. He's a big boy. He's a big boy. <laughs> he's her, he, it's not the first time he's heard it. Um, yeah. Real quick, though, Doctor Gregory, do you 
you get involved with some of the research that goes on in the Bahamas and the fisheries over there at all? Or? A little bit. We've had some exclusive permits to bring animals back for public display mm-hmm. and education. We've worked okay. with the fisheries guys over there, and I've done a lot of snorkeling and diving. So do you, with this storm, has that affected any of your work, or did you get involved with any of the research over there, like post-storm? or? What's interesting, it, it kind of helped some things. It's okay. bad. We were on the news right as COVID was coming out, right. and disasters tend to back people off of the environment for a little while. Sure. So now they've got conch. Johnny, were you telling me they've got conch in new places? They've got a bunch of things. They're kind of going positive. The reef has been broken up and redistributed. Mm-hmm. Some corals are built like staghorn to be right. wrecked every 10 years yeah. so that it spreads pieces all over and they can grow new ones. And that's kind of what happened with yeah. Dorian. And yeah. that's good. I mean, at least there's there's some, you know, I mean, obviously we're talking Silver about the, mari- the marine element yeah. versus the um, versus the, the human, human element tragedy. and, you know, and the balance that everyone tries to find between yeah. all of that. You know, that's really a big point of our show as well is just that balance. Well, there, there were there were conch everywhere. Yeah. And it really made me think because there's been a lot of discussion in the Bahamas about, you know, banning, you know, the conch, you know, taking conch like they did in the Keys and right. they did in Florida. And um, I realized this more on other trips because we went over several, several times after the immediate mm-hmm. trip where we used to have to go few miles away to a sand pat to a sand you know a sand bar with 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 the turtle grass am i is that correctly correct uh yeah it's seagrass beds in general yeah i love it and um now there were conch everywhere like you could jump off the rocks by my house and there was hundreds of conch fully mm-hmm. developed conch and conch are not a, a fast growing creature right so so you have a home over there yes yeah Yes. And where at that? Uh, it's in the Abacos. It's yeah. in a little private island uh, mm-hmm. in between Guana and Man of War. So your roots over there are pretty solid, with especially where where, where the where the um, the storm, the storm hit. hit. So when you got over there, I mean, you must have been flooding with emotions um, seeing what happened. I couldn't digest it, and I still can't digest it because you look at sometimes in life you or, or this is the first time I, I've never been to war, but you see things that your bra- your brain can't really mm-hmm. digest. It was that, um, it was that bad. Yeah, it, it was you like feeling the same way about that, Miles. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I was. And uh, if you're able to show some photos during the podcast, yeah, well, John, um, any any photos? We I know you've already sent a ton our way, and you know we any photos that anybody has, you know, John will edit it in for sure. It was Mad it Max. Was, yeah, it was very very bizarre because. Like he was saying, you know, we luckily did get there before the sun went down, but with 45 minutes to spare, probably. Mm-hmm. And as we're approaching the island, we're seeing boats, you know, 60, 70 foot boats flipped over on their side, boats on the docks. It was a mangled wreck. I mean, mm-hmm. it was, it, it looked like the place, you know, it was hit by a giant hurricane. It was bombed by Mother Nature. But yeah, it, it was completely surreal. Just every house toppled, caved in. Um, and we didn't see any people. And, you know, there was a, there was an eeriness, and especially when the sun went down mm-hmm. and it was pitch black dark, it got really eerie. And, uh, you know, we might hear something off in the distance because, you know, we didn't know what the pirate situation mm-hmm. was going to be like. The island had already been you know, looted once. They right. they'd already chased off looters once. We didn't know exactly where we were with that. So that you know, there was a tension, of course, there because you know we didn't know who was even on the island to a certain degree. You know, because mm-hmm. we we get to the marina, and, and, and of course you're not parking at your slip because the place is destroyed. So we're trying to find a place to park this, you know, our boat, and we finally find a spot, um, barely. I mean, it was really the only spot we could take. And, and after we did that, the sun went down and it became pitch black. And some people that uh, John had known who live on the island had come up. And at least we got the skinny from them that it was pretty stable that the looters had gone. And we came to the conclusion that, you know, gas was in very, very short supply. And uh, fuel for, for folks to make it over to this island to, you know, get scraps or whatever they're going to get debris, you know, from the hur- hurricane was probably not the smartest thing for anyone to do. So, you know, we uh, felt safe after a while. But, uh, yeah, it was it was bizarre. It was like a war zone. 95% of every boat that was there in the <clears throat> Abacos 
was destroyed. Perished. 95%. Yeah. yeah. Including, we, we lost an Intrepid we had over there. It was gone. Um, and on the house, on the island we were, we were seeking refuge at, where we owned the house, I believe there were 60 homes, and there was probably only six standing. Maybe seven, I'm saying. I could be off by one wow. or two. And when I see, when I meet 50 of them or 45 of them were like wiped off the map. Like you couldn't even tell that there was a house there. No, obliterated. It, it was just gone. Mm-hmm. You would just be like, see if you're standing on tile and you're like, wow, there was a house here. Anytime you have an event like this, um, you're going to have casualties, um, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I know that you guys... Uh, you know, lost some people that were close to you over there. Um, you know, I'm sorry about that. Um, and I know many did over there more than probably has been available for statistics because they're probably even in places like the mud. Mud there were people that were undocumented, you know what I mean? Thousands. And, and, and Thousands just, died just lost there. their lives and just kind of either floated away into oblivion, literally, um, both both in physical form and in, in on record. Yep, um, taken and, out and to sea. And that's sad that a life... Um, that, that happened to a life and many lives um, over there. So my condolences to all, anything like that. But you, you guys also did have a hand in um, in rescuing quite a few. 17, 17 yeah. people we uh, we rescued and in, uh, in got got them back to uh, the key the key we were on and uh, got them out either uh, through helicopters, uh, planes. Or uh, rode back on the boat with us. Mm-hmm. Um, what happened was this storm came out of the north, and normally the storms don't come out of the north there. And so it was very different. It was like they compared it to, I believe, a 1920s hurricane that hit hit, yeah. hit it wobbled, Abacos. It wobbled down, right? Yeah, it, just, it wrapped around and hit yeah. from the north. So what happened is a tidal wave built up uh, almost, and the water just kept building up. So the surge all hit at once. It wasn't like a, a gradual surge that built. Mm-hmm. It was like basically like a, 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 a tidal wave surge. And um, there was uh, a friend of mine, uh, Wilson, and, and his his, uh, his sister. Uh, his sister has a, has a boy uh, named Brendan, and there was this guy named... Uh, this man named Kalen, uh, Kalon McIntosh, who worked for the Albury Ferries. He was a waterman, a diver, all that. When the, uh, when the, when the tidal wave broke, it, whatever houses were left, it wiped everybody out of the house and out of the, you know, just swept everybody out. And Kalon grabbed the six-year-old boy, Brendan, and, uh, swam him to a, to a tree, uh, cause the water was 10 feet or however high, and, and he swam, Kalon, Kalon swam, Brendan, who was six at the time, to a tree, got him up in a gumbo limbo tree, got him secure, and uh, he said, stay here, I'm going to go try and find everybody else that was in the house. And uh, they wound up finding Brendan in the tree. Six or seven hours later, the water was still eight feet high, and they found him asleep in the tree. And they asked him, uh, you know, how'd you get, how'd you get here? You know, what, how, you know, mm-hmm. and where's the rest of your family? Where is everybody? And he said, uh, Kalon, uh, got me to the tree and then told me to stay here. He'd be back. And Kalon, you know, was a waterman and a Bahamian diver and all that. And, and, uh, he went back, uh, to try and save people. And, uh, Kalon was never found, never seen again. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, those are the heroes. There's a lot of heroes that will never, that people don't even know about, that, that did incredible things, you know, saving six-year-old boys, saving old elderly people. Like, we helped out. We did our best to help people, and we did our best to come to the rescue of people. But, like, the real heroes to me are these guys like Kalon that, that, that gave up their life. You know, he the could, ultimate price. K- Kalon could have stayed on that tree with Brendan. He didn't have to go back. <clears throat> he didn't have to go back to try and help. Others, but he did. Yeah, and uh, he was never found again. That's yeah. sad and unfortunate. I mean, you know, that's it. I I hate hearing stories like that, but they're important to tell. They're important, and it's and and these people still don't have power there. They still don't have housing there. They still right. don't have a police station there. They still don't have anything. So I'm glad you're bringing that up because as much as we want to say that now everyone was here um, a year ago, a year and a couple of months ago, right, and at this point, 
um, when all the outloving of support came from Florida, especially, um, I don't think any other state could have nearly come close to what Florida did for the Bahamas in that moment, um, which kind of goes to show how, you know, what, what a great state we are, really. People can make fun of Florida all they want, but I am just so proud to be a Floridian. I am so proud to say this is where I was born and raised um, because when it all comes down to it, you know, Floridians are strong. We may, you know, we may be a split state, um, you know, politically speaking, um, but when it all comes down to it, we do have the ability to pull together, you know, and, and I kind of hope that um, that can be an example for the rest of the nation someday. Um, but the support that they gave to the Bahamas was just unprecedented, number one. Unprecedented. Right? Yeah. And um, it was just, you know, inspiring, um, to say the least. And, you know, everyone gave and gave and gave. We gave, yeah, for sure. But, you know, others gave and, like, it didn't stop. Like, everybody had a hand. Like, if you had a business, you had an organization, you either set yourself up as a collection post or you did a, some sort of fundraiser. Um, you know, we created the shirt, but others created shirts as well. You know, that raised a lot of money. Yeah. Nearly um, everyone I yeah. know in business, that's a good point you made. Nearly yeah. everyone I know... Uh, from my pediatrician to folks like yourself, everyone was involved, mm -hmm. helping in any way they could. Yeah. And Tropic Air, uh, yep. just am amazing what they did. And Cardinal Gibbons. Yeah. Dude, everybody. Um, I mean, Gibbons, you know, even like the thing, you know, Freedom Fighter Outdoors and the, 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 the Greater Miami Billfish that we were associated with, <laughs> you know, and, you know, Crook and Crook and... You know, all the different, all the boat companies that are here had something to do with it. And just the independent people that were going back and forth Brian on their Smith. Sonical, Yes, absolutely. Brian Smith helped find, uh, got a scholarship for, for one of the special needs girls. Uh, Tom Mahan, who was yeah. our teacher when we yeah. were at Gibbons, uh, who's the president of the school now, mm -hmm. gave, gave a scholarship to one of the Bahamian boys because they didn't have a school anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Caden Malone. And uh, he, I asked him for help and, and he was there. Yeah. And and helped educate. Uh, Westminster helped. Uh, there was families that helped. Miles's family helped donate a house. Um, I had Bahamian families living with me in my own house. Yeah, we had five people in our house, and then we just so happened to have a. Uh, my sister had moved, and the house was empty, and so we were able to put that family into that house. Mm -hmm. And um, I got the two girls, they were in high school, and you feel real bad because, the, you know, we've seen from the coronavirus what it's done to the kids with school all yeah. across the board and how this has been super duper disruptive for everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we made it a point to get these kids like back in school. And right away. The high school kids. So we got the two girls into Westminster. And then, like you said, we got Caden into Cardinal Gibbons and one of the girls had uh, special needs so she ended up uh, going to Calvary I yeah because they had a program but yeah no it, I mean if you would have if you would have told me I was going to do that I think I can speak for John too or maybe all of us in Florida <laughs> as much as we all help if, if they would have told us we would have dropped everything and done all of the stuff that we did you just would never have believed that you would or could do it we just went out there and did it there was uh, really you know it was motivated by love and concern, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it, it was a time I will never forget, and I'm sure, you know, they will never forget. I think the message I want to make about that, though, is that it's still that time. It's still going on. Right? Yeah. It's so, still going and, on. And, yeah. I, and I think even though, you know, I mean, human behaviors are fleeting, right? Just as we see with the, you know, even COVID behaviors and, you know, could be, you know, an example, a recent example of somehow, you know, because in the very beginning of this, everyone was super tight with it. Now, like, right, you get a little used to it and, you know, um, we, whether that's correct or not, I'm not, I'm not to say, um, but it's the same thing with, with the Abaco situation because people over there, like, you know, they're still living with it every day and there's still a lot more to be done. And, um, you know, so I wanted to bring that up and say, hey, we continue to yes, do things yeah. for them. And, they, they and still need we, help. And they still need help. And um, we've discussed doing um, more promotions. The problem with it right now is that, you know, in the moment, you know, everyone kind of struck the iron while it was hot, while it was emotional, and they were like, okay, you know, let's, um, 
you know, let's help everyone, help everyone, help. And now when it's like, oh, that hurricane was like a year and a half ago. And especially in Florida, we realize, okay, yeah, after a year and a half of a hurricane, everyone should be back to normal. Well, yeah, in Florida, we have FEMA. Yeah. You know, we have federally, you know what I mean, funded programs that will come in and help and, you know, give funding to help, you know, and that we're America. It's a little different. The Bahamas is a completely different country. They don't True. have those resources. Puerto Rico still has problems right. from, from their hurricane. Puerto Rico still does have what, problems, yeah. That was two and a half Part years ago. Part of the ago. reason for that is the size of them. So, you know, if... Florida gets hit. It's a portion of Florida mm-hmm. that is hit. It's South Florida. It's the Gulf, what have you. The rest of the state is still up and running with electricity mm-hmm. and provisions. Then you can drive and go places. When you're on an island in the Bahamas or Puerto Rico, and that thing gets hit by a hurricane of this size, the entire system is shut down. Mm-hmm. You know, and the, yeah. the, they're on an island. So that's that's what makes it more difficult. Uh, certainly for, for them to recover. I, right? rem- I remember my father asking me when I had all these um, Bahamian family living in my house, and he said, well, what's your plan, John? And uh, I said, uh, I don't know. Plan isn't a word I know yeah, right now. I don't, yeah. I don't know, Dad, but yeah. I'm not going to send you send them to a refugee camp in Nassau or yeah. tents. These kids need school. They need they, 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 the, the family, like... The Bahamas, I gained as much, and I think Miles can say the same. I gained as much from them living with us and being with us and the help we did mm-hmm. as they gained from us. Absolutely. Because they yeah. taught us, Bahamians are very family orientated. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, I said, Dad, I don't have a plan. That I can't send them to Nassau because it's not, it's not the right thing to do. And right. we're just going to. Play it by ear and just yeah. and just do the best we can and and that was the plan. <laughs> yeah, so I, I I think when people look at and and they realize today like oh wow there's still so much to build you know compared to what we're used how fast we're used to recovering over here and people might think it's strange. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, John. And there's other and guys. Wait, and and hold on, and you know what else is strange? I'm going to interject this here. Is our strange questions we have from? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> From our audience, right? We have a little, we have a handful of them today, right? I didn't type them out on paper, right? I'm, I'm going to segue from this a little bit, All right. right? And then I'm going to read out a couple of our strange questions um, that we have for our guests. Um, and I will start out with, I'm not going to start out with the jumbo question because we have every one episode, there's a jumbo question. He never wins. <laughs> Just so you know, so you can't pick him as the, the jumbo winner. jumbo question? So yeah, we, we ask our strange questions. Justin inevitably always. Justin Laden then Laden then you oh, know him from Gibbons. Oh, the jump he was yeah. he was our great yeah, Gibbons. Of course, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. so and then what I so he always asks so questions. So we're not gonna lead off with him. Um so uh Dave Farrell, um, former editor of Marlin magazine, um, instructor of Marlin University, host of the Florida Insider Fishing Report, um is a very candid individual. And he asks, how much does the tons of cow crap hitting the fields of central Florida affect their water quality? Do you guys know the answer to this since you guys are water experts? Yes, it does. It does. Dr. Gregory, a- that, answer. Yeah. So we have the biggest calving farms in all of Florida. There's a yes. lot of a lot of baby cows in the middle. And it isn't just them. I mean, we see the big agriculture as well. There's a lot of fertilizer. There's a lot of nutrient there's a world where we can manage that very well. The Everglades themselves are a big, a big nutrient sink. We can grow more, more grass, more trees if needed. But we haven't gotten to the point where we take it seriously enough because we haven't seen it enough coastal repercussions, mm-hmm. but we are now. And right. I, yeah, like you could talk about Florida coming together, taking care of problems. I love it. It's absolutely yeah. right. Like these right. guys, we're smart. Our politicians are smart. Our people are smart about coastal issues. Don't mess with fishing. Don't mess with the coast. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, there is too much nutrient. It's dispersing on the east side, on the west side, down through the Keys, growing too much seaweed. But we're managing it very quickly. Mm-hmm. We're piecing this together. There's plans. There's scientists. There's conservationists. And there's people. And it's all just coming together well. But right. yes, so, uh, I would say that the answer um, is yes. Th- mm-hmm. The answer is yes that we're between Okeechobee. In the Everglades, there is car- cow farms, and that 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 poop mm-hmm. is 
getting washed into the system. Yeah. Along with, you know, the cane, you know, the cane fields, the all the byproducts the, that come with. Yeah. And when he says nutrients, it's always something that I always get <laughs> him and I always joke about. Because people think of nutrients as health. They're like, hey, I take nutrients. That's helps a healthy plants thing. Grow. Yeah, it helps you grow. You take your vitamins. You want to be. But when he's speaking, when Dr. Gregory's speaking about nutrients, he's speaking of o- over nutrients, which are technically would be defined as pollutants. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's, yep. All right. And it's nitrogen, phosphorus. Uh, we could go on and on. All the stuff e- they spray the banks and, with. So it looks pretty, right? All that kind of stuff. That's right. Right. Yep. So I got it. All right. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dave Farrell. Um, and and with I, I led this question that we're going to talk about a lot of clean water issues today. Um, so they're, the questions aren't as strange as some of the other ones are. So they're actually a little kind of serious. Um, this uh, Michael Dixon asks, are we still on track to mostly shut the remaining outfall pipes by 2025? Where do we see most of the effluent going instead can sustain or can we sustain with anticipated population growth over the next 10 to 20 years, he asks. Like, what's your take on on that? I know that was kind of a loaded question. If you want to read it and just kind of, like, recap on that thing. Oh, I'll go the, for the it. theme is there. We All get right. it. Uh, the, the goal of, of what we're, if we're getting into the waterways, the goal of what we're trying to do as a, as a company and as a team of mm-hmm. people who is uh, Miles Foreman, myself, Dr. Gregory, uh, Shane Lathanier, and uh, a man named John Millage, who handles a lot of our government relations and our legal uh, stuff, mm-hmm. is at the end of the day, you got to remove this stuff mm-hmm. out of the water. And Mike, Mike Lambrecht. And Mike Lambrecht. And Mike Lambrecht from CCA. Mike, Mike, sorry. I'm legend. I'm sorry, Mike. Mike, you're my boy. You know that. Mike's been on this show. Yes. And Mike's and Mike's 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 a friend, personal friend, and a friend of the studio. And Mike's part of our company as well. And the goal is we have to remove, we have to remove the nutrient. We have to remove the pollutants. It it, it doesn't get solved. And at the end of the day, they talk about flushing and how much gets flushed. And there's, there's a lot of debate about how much gets flushed from inland waterways and and all that. Um, We don't think very much. Uh, We've done testing that shows that, that, that it doesn't flush greatly. Uh, and there's different water columns, Dr. Gregory, you can get mm-hmm. into that. But even if it did flush, the ocean's not our toilet. We're not, we're not here to flush pollutants into the ocean uh, as our toilet. Yeah, right. and, and before, right before Dr. Gregory comes in, and it's important that we look to the future. He asked, you know, how's it looked at a future population growth, right. and more people coming down. We need to develop. So that's always a general concern in the of state course. of Florida, regardless of, of the water quality. But yeah. But as, as far as the water goes and the environment, we need to come up with methods to keep it clean and stay on top of it and continue to innovate. And, you know, that will greatly improve things because there's really not. Mother Nature can only do so much because it's facing a lot of man made, we'll call it catastrophe or. You know, uh, what's the word? Um, um, Intervention. Like irresponsibility. Right. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'll pass it off to Dr. Gregory. We have we have a lot of people and a lot of wild cards in mm-hmm. effect. We've got good plans for Florida, but when it comes down to it, the government can only do so much. Mm-hmm. They've invested more and more, which is amazing. But it's, I think, private innovation that's going to take care of business. Yeah. And it's going to be motivated, just like solar's growing on its own. Mm-hmm. And... Smart planning for buildings, lead certi- lead certified, um, smart drainage, smart recycling. It's all about, like, we've already kind of hinted on it two or three times. Florida's are hardcore. We have a country in rock and roll. We've got a diversity of people, but we face down so much craziness between the animals and the hurricanes and all these things. Mm-hmm. we got to lead the way so the next generation. Big part right. of what I do is setting it up so these guys can win. Right, and that's why I think it's important that, that Johnny's in the room with us today because a lot of this rests on our shoulders to make it good for him. What is it? I mean, yeah. what, what, how is this? We've already messed up a couple things. How does that mess you up literally every day? You can't do so many fun things. <laughs> um, like, I would jump off my dad's boat and go in the water, swim, like, because I have a friend. He's like, so we live in the canal. My friend Carter, he lives like over there, and then the Hagensons go up, like they're above us. So like I would paddleboard 
over there, and I I just can't do that anymore. It's kind of yeah. messed up because there's poop in the water. I can't really, you know. That kind of that's a little inconvenient, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can't throw a cast net. You can throw yeah. it once, and then he. Can't. That's about it. <laughs> that's about it because he, you know, as a kid, it's not so easy. You know, you put the, the cast net in your mouth as a kid. You know, right. that's you know how little kids can throw cast nets. You gotta, yeah. and he, you know, he can throw it once. And that's then it. it's it. You know, yeah. whatever mullet he gets, they go in the bait pen, and, and that's what he's got to live with, uh, you know, until we clean it, clean out the cast net. And right. You're certainly not going to jump in and, and swim through that. And Yeah, he used to swim across the canal to his yeah. best friend's house, and they would play king of the paddle board, and they'd <laughs> wrestle, and right? Mm-hmm. And just fun things like that that we all grew up doing. And it's sad that that... Johnny and and uh, lots of uh, lots of other kids and and the future generations are currently being robbed of that life that yeah. we grew up and took for granted. To be honest yeah. with you, we took it for granted. Absolutely. I mean, the, the entire community down here, where the, you know the paddle boarders, the kayakers, the tourists, fishermen. Uh, I it, definitely it, think that lifeblood. there's a new there's a new perspective of the value on what we really have here than there used to be mm-hmm. when, when we were younger. Um, I because I, I really think that we, we just grew up here and we're like, oh, this is how life is. Took it for granted. And the more you go around the world and the more you go around the country, you realize, wow, we really are a jewel. And right now that, that jewel is a little dusty. You know, it's a little tarnished. It's and a good we, way to we put need it. to kind of clean it up, you know. And I do want to say this, that um, we've done a lot of testing all over. We've done testing all over the place. Yeah in lakes, in man-made lakes Mm -hmm. out west, out in this area, all over the place. And we're getting similar results from everywhere. So let me, let me, um, we'll get to that in one second, because I want to, I want to finish up some of these questions here. So that's a good question from, from uh, Michael Dixon. So I got you guys kind of going, which I I really want to get deep into that. Yeah, yeah, I I know it's, it's, it's an easy thing for me to do. I know a button's a push here, so. Yeah. <laughs> but let me um, let, let me get to uh, this is the jumbo. Jumbo gave two questions today, right? Maybe you can answer them. You might know them better than you know, little Johnny might know them better than most of them. So he says, "Why are some fish at the bottom of the ocean?" Um. Well, well, there's there's poop in the water, and I assume they're just dying. I mean, all right, all right. That's, that's about a, it. That's a good answer. What were you saying? You're giving me that, some scientific that, theory about yes, there. Yes. Well, you have you have pelagic, uh, which my right. hat is, or you have benthic creatures, and like if you look at a, a mutton's tail or a grouper's tail, mm-hmm. it's it's built. It's a big tail. It's to make big thrust to get away. They're not built to travel mm-hmm. long distances. So. There's fish on the bottom that are designed to live on the bottom. They're designed to get away from predators or to attack with 20, 30 yard bursts. They're not meant to be pelagic open ocean creatures. Um, right. I, I do need to remind you that this is the jumbo question. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if he's so is he referring the real to just answer. Dead the, the real answer is why are some fish at the bottom of the, to the question why are some fish at the bottom of the ocean, which he gives the answer. Says they They're dropped, dead. They dropped out of school. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I, I was on Johnny here. I want to do a couple of fun ones. Yeah. Right? Drop out of school. I was also thinking of the talking. Well, let's head not talk about drop out of sc- lifetime. <laughs> there are fish at the bottom of the ocean. Yep. Yep. How did they get here? Tell Jimbo we're not allowed to talk about anything to do with dropping out of school with yeah, my kid. Right, exactly. Right, Stay then, in school. Then here, here we go. Here we go. All right, here's the second Jumbo question, and maybe you can help answer this. You think real hard about this one. All right, Johnny? Okay. What did one ocean say to the other ocean? Um, Ready? He, 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 he just waved. He just waved. Yes. Um, <laughs> wow. You got yeah, it. There you go. Nice. <laughs> You're the man, Johnny. Nice. Good job. All right. And the last question. Good job, Johnny. I'm very proud of you. That's wow. that, that, made, that made my day right there. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, the, Andy Moises asked Los about uh, Costa back in the day. Ask about tuna fishing, El Nino, pioneering the southern zone, and circle hooks. Also, this is probably the one you're going to want to answer. Ask about my boat handling and snapper fishing. Who? I don't know. Andy says Moyes? This. Andy I says mean, this. Moyes is the man. I mean, there is... Andy is the man. There is no... Um, I was lucky enough 
to learn from Andy Moyes, Larry Withal, and Jason Tiny Walcott. Mm -hmm. And those three guys were our legends. And, and we'll tease the fact that Jason's going to be on the show in, in a few weeks. Right. Yeah. Rest, and rest in peace to Larry. Um, but Andy's the man. I mean, he. we were the first. He. We lived in the jungles of Costa Rica in the 90s, in the mm -hmm. mid-90s. Los Sueños did not exist. Yeah. For us, we to get to where we're, our fishing uh, lodge was, you had to take an hour and a half trip out out of river. Then you had to wait like it was like pipeline breaking at the mouth of the river. You had to time it, and people died. The old owner of the of the lodge died coming out that river. Really? Yeah, it was sketchy to say the least. And where then, was that? What's that? Where was that, near Haco? No, uh, the Osa Peninsula, down south. Okay, yeah. So north so of Golfito. So more towards the Capos area. Yeah, no, uh, south of Capos, yeah. north of uh, Golfito. Gotcha. So um, it was called Agla de Osa Inn, and I, Moyes was a captain, uh, the captain, and he invited me. I, I, I met him when I was nine years old, and he taught me how to throw a cast net and taught me how to fish. And he would show up on his, he'd have his Bahamian mullet and... Uh, you know, mullet mm -hmm. haircut, and right. he would show up with his motorcycle or his low rider, and he, w w us kids, would be there fishing for hours. We need to dig up an Andy Moyes mullet. Oh, he's got picture. it. He's got it. He's got it. Yeah, he's got All it. Right, I'm gonna have to text him and get that. And one. Uh, I'll so pay him. he he taught me how to do a lot of these things, and we would sit there for hours on the bridges with our mullet, trying to catch snook and jack and and throwing zero spooks and and all the mm -hmm. different stuff. And Moyes would pull up in his on his motorcycle or his low rider, and he would be there for like 10 minutes and yoke like a 30 pound snook and we would be like what yeah. you know and then he would let us hold us hold it he would teach us how to tie knots he would teach us everything and then 10 you know more than 10 years later 12 years later i'm living in the jungle uh of costa rica as a single, you know, single mate on a thirty-one uh, game fisherman called the Albatross, yeah, mating yeah. for him, wow. ma mating for him, and I, it went from this guy teaching me when I was a kid, when I was nine, to actually work in the jungle, pioneering fishing in Costa Rica. Yeah, and uh, you know, it was single screws uh, boats, so you had to be really good at backing down because a single screw boat wants to, to go one way when you're backing down, so you had to really predict how you were going to handle the fish. Um, we got the first black Bart tuna candy ever when Bart was still alive to use down there. We could, we could troll it like 22, 23 knots. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a hard head, heavy weighted fish. Um, Moyes was the man. I mean, he, he, he still is the man. Yeah. He, he taught me so much and he's still one of my good friends. I had lunch. Well, we his, that's why I got a sticker right there behind everyone's head when they're on the show. I had lunch with him yesterday. There is no better, there is no better fisherman and lure maker in today's world, in my opinion, um, than any Moyes. If yeah. I had to pick a dream team, yeah, he would be on it. And we did a lot of production with Moyes, filming mm -hmm. the oceans around the world, uh, yep. doing crazy stuff. And Moyes was part of it. So I don't know if I completely answered all of what Andy asked. Yeah, um, you did good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's totally good. No, I, I, but he's a legend, I, and he should get the. Respect. I think the whole point of that was really to just you know put a little spotlight on Andy for. A and I want to say thank you to Andy for not letting me fall off the tuna tower. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Andy. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so we got to pick a winner here. I think it's uh, that Michael Dixon question that kind of got you guys going on the. Um, and Dave Farrell is going to be very mad at me because he Dave sends a question like every episode and. I actually forgot to ask Dave's question on the previous episode, and he texted me. He's like, you didn't answer my, ask my question. I remember meeting Dave Farrell in Venezuela in 99 uh, when uh, we, we used to fish out of La Guara before mm -hmm. the mudslides, and Dave would come down there, and they fished. Uh, what's the the photographer? I, I'm, I'm, uh, he's a fam he, used to own, he used to have his own tournament down in, in Venezuela. Uh Path forward. Richard Gibson or Richard, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. I believe it was his name. Yeah. Uh, uh, and he used to have a great tournament down in Venezuela back in the day. We actually caught a super grand slam with Andy Moyes in Venezuela. Nice. Not many people can say they caught a super grand slam. Especially and, now. And Johnny caught a 600-pound bluefin tuna. Yep. With, with Andy Moyes in Nova Scotia. You know, I was supposed to go to Nova Scotia with Andy this year, and they, that trip got canceled because of uh, the you-know-what. We, we just call it the you-know-what now. Yeah. We, only, we only say the C word in here. 
But that's also a special part about Andy is it's come full circle where he's teaching my my son yeah. fishing techniques, yeah, which is kind of really cool. You caught a 600-pound bluefin tuna? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? I mean, not all by myself, but yeah. How much do you weigh? Right now, um, like seventy. Like seventy. How much did you weigh back then? How old were you? Seven years old, I think. We. Yeah, I probably weighed like fifty. Fifty pounds, and you caught a six hundred pound bluefin tuna. Well, we had to have someone sit in a bucket, and uh-huh. he sat on top of uh, Captain John Stevens in the bucket, and put it in low gear, and uh, on the one thirty, mm-hmm. and Johnny did all the cranking, but we couldn't. He would have been yoked. Uh, we, he didn't have enough weight to hold yeah. down. Yeah. I mean, you're fighting a bluefin. You're putting. Tremendous yep. amount of drag pressure on the fish. Even if you, even if you gotta stand up, but you gotta you gotta lean way back on that. We right? even we even yeah. let him get away with the double handed technique because yeah. he was he was, you know, we normally would give someone a lot of hard right. time about a do- the double hand. But Man, I was eight, like you're seven. Seven. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Good job, Johnny. Proud of you, buddy. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so all right, cool. So listen, we touched on a few things there. Um, in the questions. Um, and I know we talked a lot about the abacus. One of the reasons that I really wanted to bring that up was A, I thought it was important just to bring it up. Um, and, um, B, just to kind of tease a little bit of a spotlight about what you guys are made of, right? Because I'm looking at like, you know, in, in the other partners that you mentioned, um, as well, um, with, with Mike and the crew, um, of, you know, kind of a dream team for, of Floridians, here that intrinsically care about what happens. Um, it's not just, um, you know, hey, we got an idea, we're gonna make a ton of money or anything like that. You know, that's not what this comes from. This isn't what it's all about at all. Um, this is all about caring for the next generation um, and doing the right thing. And what I'm talking about is a lot of the work that you guys have done. Um, both locally and statewide um, for, but mostly locally at the moment, uh, for Florida's clean waterways. Um, Some of the innovations that you guys have been um, developing, um, a lot of the heart that you guys have been displaying um, in your work, and it shows. Um, Take me through some of um, what you guys want to discuss about maybe your company or maybe some of the things that have been happening in Fort Lauderdale. I know I, all I know with this one, this is kind of a softball to you guys. Like the, like, cause I know you guys can sit there and talk about this forever. And I want you to, right. Cause at this point I probably don't need to comment on it much. And we should drop some knowledge my way. Um, take the lead, any one of you guys and, and just, just lead yourselves into this one. I think this is for Dr. Gregory to first talk about the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause the first I will say this though, you know, let me just, before you, before you get to that, right. You talked about like all the, the Bahamas stuff and the Costa Rica stuff like that, but you are world traveled yourself, my friend, right? Aust- right? Yeah. Australia, Brazil, yeah. right. It, it, all over the place the, the, where you've done both studying and research. And, you know, and I think it's important for the people listening to understand that, that when you speak, it comes from a deep, deep place of, and, and, and a and deep the reef, understanding. Of the Reef this. Institute, where he donate, right. he has a nonprofit that donates how many twenty hours a week to teaching children. They do a lot of education, and we've got coral that's special permitted. Great partners in the government, mm-hmm. and uh, it's part of a big initiative. To this, I have traveled. Yeah, I did a, a master's in Hawaii. That was awesome. Right, Brazil for more research. Been all around the world a couple of times. Australia for a year doing the Barrier Reef. This is the front line right mm-hmm. now. Yeah. This is where the biggest, most important science is happening. Mm-hmm. We've got the most people on top of the third biggest barrier reef on the planet, and it's suffering. We have the, oh, we talk about the barrier reef is 50% dead. This Florida thing is like 97% dead. And it's so important for so many reasons. Can you please repeat that one last time? Ladies everyone. and gentlemen, we're at less than 5% of what a healthy reef should be, and it's critical for against erosion, protecting us during storm surge, mm-hmm. and the economy itself. We got fishers, divers, everybody yep. relying on it. Whether you're, you know, half our South Florida industry is related to it in some capacity. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's a huge piece of the market. It's a huge part of our lives. And I think now we're getting to the really the sweet spot of this t- conversation. And, and, you know, ultimately what we want to dive deep into, um, you know, and, you know, talk about, you know, and this is one of the reasons, um, or the biggest reasons why Johnny's in the room, 
this morning because this, this is all for the future play here, right? This is all for the health of not only just, um, you know, the environment of, of Florida, but, you know, the socioeconomic impact that it could have as well um, just for the people and, and, you know, nature combined. So I'm going to kind of like just let this, let you guys kind of take over everything that you guys are doing right now and give me some statistics. I want you to scare the audience a little bit if you could, because they, because they need to be scared a little bit, I think. Right. Well, on the one hand, we've identified a lot of the major reasons why the coast is not doing well. There's great new rules about developing. You got to transplant the number of mangroves in a relevant spot. If you cut down just one, Zoning is really important for putting down new pilings and dredging channels, and they're very responsible about those things. But there's some big, big picture things, and we talked a little bit about it with the cow poop and the Let's talk about farming. the, the cyan, cyanobacteria. The cyanobacteria. I've been tro- struggling these, with that some word. some of the pollutants? Yeah. Well, it's the main the one. I, I'm just kind of going to tag that. You know. it, it's, no, <laughs> but this trademark is... Trademark that before you guys say it. <laughs> this, is, this is the kryptonite to our waterways. This What's is, it called again? This is, would be the kryptonite, Superman. No, uh, I know, but what... Cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria? Yes. Okay. Why don't you explain? It's blue green algae, but okay. it's okay. So it's a big piece of the puzzle. But it's, it's not actually a, blue green. It's a canary in the coal mine. It's the slimy, sometimes maroon, sometimes gray green, sometimes blue green, sometimes brown. Super bacteria. I'm I'm actually colorblind, so I'm just going by what they say. But at the end of the day, this stuff would be what we'd use to pioneer Mars or the Moon. It can survive in deep sea thermal environments. It creates its own nitrogen, so it's a nitrogen fixer. It just needs phosphorus. This is what is starting to line entire coastal habitats in South Florida because it survives where other stuff doesn't survive, and then it perpetuates itself. It kills its neighbors because it's toxic, eats them, spreads more. And so when we're seeing it more and more associated, I mean, it was blue-green algae blooms. We've got... Other blooms. We've got red tides and we've got anaerobic conditions that happen from bacterial blooms, algal blooms alike. But at the end of the day, this is a nasty one. This is in the backs of a lot of not well irrigated canals along grass beds where grass used to be. There's just slime coats of this stuff suppressing other biology. It's a it's a moon bacteria. It's you call it stuff. A, an archaic element, right? Which well, it's means... in this family of archaic bacteria. They've been around since forever. They're around. They can survive in super salty, super super sulfuric, very low. Oxygen. They create. They're a bacteria that uses light. So they're basically cheating. They're a plant animal that barely needs anything to survive, and kills everything around them. But I mean, uh, that's a part of the problem, and that's kind of our indicator in canary in the coal mine. What we're seeing is coastal imbalances, lots of excess nutrient, neutralution, pollutants. Pollutants. <laughs> All right. And we're Did we create a new word? Did we create a new I word? Contributed. I contributed. <laughs> I, I, I kind of like that. <laughs> pollutants. And you should trademark that. I didn't say that. Tell him. <laughs> Full time, credit. Time stamp this episode. Full credit. <laughs> um, I've, I, again, I've traveled. I've seen imbalances in ecosystems, and we are at the forefront here and recent developments in South Florida. There's so many people who rely on a nice environment. That's why people come to Florida. They want to go to the beach. They want to have a good experience. And when the beaches are getting dragged away and there's coliform bacteria in areas where kids want to swim and there's dead fish piling up on the beach, it's mission critical. And when we have big unfortunate circumstances such as, Fish die-offs in Miami, sewage breaks in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we need to get going on this stuff. And now I've, I think I've painted a dire enough picture that we sure. can explore. And we'll, we'll talk more about some science and some real facts and some... Uh, but let's talk about some solutions. I mean, well, at the end uh, of the day... Well, also, I think that there's a few things happening. You have microorganisms... In smaller particles, right? The nitrogen, the phosphorus, the mm-hmm. the, the, the algaes. Um, but you also have personal responsibility pollution where there's a lot of plastics. There's a lot of, of lawn debris blown into the water. There's a lot of things that, where do you think that goes? It accumulates. It's all right. It doesn't go, it doesn't go anywhere. It sits on the bottom 
and it creates, it feeds this stuff. Yeah. It, it, it's, construction. Impervious yeah, surfaces are a big deal. Yeah, construction yeah. runoff, street runoff. Uh, when they, when you know, uh, Congressman Brian Mass trying to m- make sure they can't release um, the lake unless the 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 particles are eight per billion, I believe they're yeah, they're, they're trying to, they're, they're trying to come up with new laws on when they can and can't release the lake, and and uh, it's it's a problem from large plastics and large debris, lawn debris, all the way down to microorganisms, mm-hmm. and. Why don't we talk about, Dr. Gregory, we did some testings where we took uh, two and a half gallon buckets. What's the what's the cause of this this uh, cyanic? Is it cyanic? Did I say that? I want to say sciatic. There, it's so. cyan- I struggled with it for cyan- a long time. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what's really the generator of that? The phosphorus from... Just everything combined. Yeah, called plant fertilizer. That's a major ingredient in plant yeah. fertilizer and uh, waste, be it yeah. animal, human... Right, right. It's in there. All right, so defecations and and mix of defec- iguanas yeah. pooping that aren't from here yeah. in the water. Ducks that aren't don't belong. Can we belong. just shoot them though? The, the iguanas. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say a lot of invas- invasive elements that yeah. are creating this perfect storm or this sinister cocktail. Right. All right. Of just things we're doing in our day to day lives, or you know, different animals. It's like a giant combination that's set off this, uh, you know, us on a bad pathway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And our ecosystem is so out of balance. I mean, Dr. Gregory, you can uh, talk about this. If we had a healthy natural ecosystem, then it can help handle some of this stuff, right? But our eco, our ecology or... Uh, there's is, the deer in the northeast and all the way down through here because there's no big predators. I caught a cane toad the other day. I was on a mission because we're teaching invasive species next week. I've got lionfish everywhere throughout our education. Cane toad the other day. There's a lot of invasive species that are that are wreaking havoc on the environment. Imbalances. And then the top-level predators, I know you're passionate about sharks. These, mm-hmm. these guys, because the regulation is so blanket and so alarmist, it's contributing to an ecosystem imbalance where we've got too much regulation for some things and not enough for other things. We've got mm-hmm. pollutants strangling out all the middle level fish and no reef structure to create shelter for algae eating fish. And at the same time we have uh, big level predators that are super protected. Yeah. And I'm not saying slay all the Goliath groupers, but there's areas where there's a lot of Goliath and not a lot for them to eat mm-hmm. um, because fish and wildlife is amazing. It's the best of, of any fish and wildlife that I've seen because they're so smart, so top down, but political can only do so much. And fishermen, same story. When we have an imbalanced ecosystem to begin with though, from invasive species and from nutrient coming in and pollution and all these things, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We can't even begin to address high level issues until the whole ecosystem is looked at as an organism. But you see the shark problem as a problem, right? I mean, you see in Florida itself, right? It, it's the, uh, So the shark problem, there's an imbalance. We right. protect the sharks so well that they get so smart. They're top-level predators. They know what they're doing. They're instinctive, but they're very good at what they do once they figure out something that works. So we have these populations of sharks that have established themselves or have a created a pattern to follow fishing vessels. They're just waiting for certain yeah, sounds or smells. Yeah, they sources, yeah. Yeah, and they're thriving. They're doing very well. So there's probably a, a regulation that's already coming into effect. I'm imagining Fish and Wildlife is thinking about it because they've heard, they listen well to the fishermen. They do um, round the state discussions about how to open grouper seasons, what to do about mm-hmm. snappers. And I'm sure there's some shark conversations being had. I'm going to imagine that there's a world where they create a cull of some sort on certain species, either well, tags or whatnot. We have um, a regular on the program is Catherine Art Sapp, mm-hmm. who um, is widely known as one of the most accomplished and most respected anglers um, Absolutely. In, in the world, if not a uh, just all of South Florida, just especially. For sure, he's a legend um, in the making as well, like because yeah. he's, he's like prime time right now. Um, he serves on the, I'm going to say this wrong, this is, but it's the National Fisheries Council in a nutshell, um, to where he's a representative, um, of the angling community. 
Um, and he has these lengthy discussions and these lengthy meetings um, with politicians and your boards of politicians, boards of scientists. Uh, and he is continually preaching like, hey, guys, me and my buddies or my colleagues, we're the ones that are out on the water every day. We're the ones that see what's happening. We're the ones that can give you the stats, can tell you what's going on. And then what his big complaint is, is that a few of these scientists will go out. Um, and I say this um, with full knowledge that I'm speaking to a scientist. Uh, will go out in areas where um, they don't know where the fish are going to be, like Art knows. They don't understand the bottom structures of and the feeding habits of these fish. Um, they'll go out for an afternoon, drop a few lines, and say, no, no fish here. We need to put up more regulations and no sharks here. It's like, yeah, because they're all being caught in 300 right now, you know, because that's where all the fishermen are, and they're learned, and they're they're in these behaviors. But he's, he preaches these things at these meetings, and it just falls on deaf ears, and nothing gets done. And that's a big complaint that he has is that the science community both doesn't have the, the outdoorsman understanding of this, um, and they just just – or just looking at it purely not from a sportsman standpoint. Hmm. I, I feel like there's a new generation of scientists, the hybrid super mutant that is fishermen. Well, they, they need to be it. on this board. A good, a, a good <laughs> buddy of he's, mine. He's, yeah. he's one of them. A good buddy of mine. He's striving to get his degree now. He's one of the fishermen on perfect catch. Mm -hmm. And he sees it. They all see it. The oceans are not doing great yeah. for them to survive. Right. It's a existential thing. You yeah. got to be smart about it. You got to think about it. Yeah. You got to know they're it. going back. They're going back to the politicians well, and they're telling this false information. And they're making legislation over it. Well, and like we yeah. said, I talked to Dr. Gregory about this, about sharks, because I know it's something you're very passionate about mm -hmm. and, and, and SAP's very passionate about. Right. And, you know, you go to an efficient and there's a regulation of whatever it is, uh, 10 or 12 you're allowed to catch, but you wind up losing 20 to catch 10. Right. So you're actually wiping out you're 32. Doing more damage. You, 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 yeah, it's not a it's not a real regulation because the sharks are are eating, you know, two thirds of your catch. So yeah. you're wiping out. And they're not listening to the fishermen. That's the big problem. <laughs> I want to yeah. I want to believe that there's a world where Florida Fish and Wildlife because they they're on the ball, but it's usually just a little delayed. Right. So you know, red snapper and sharking back in the day and all these things have come to. Uh, evolve to the point where they are, but they're not quite at the reality of the situation that the fishermen can give input yeah. on. But there's been a lot of great town halls and a lot of good input that has been listened to. Statistics were compiled. They've got observers on the boats with some of the best fishermen. Mm -hmm. Ideally, and I, I don't know if this is exact, this is not my area, but there could be somebody who's in the South Florida fisheries, fish and wildlife, who could come in and or call in or whatever, yeah. talk to I mean, it's definitely it's, it's definitely an ongoing investigation, if you will, the investigation. But there's a, there's a Facebook group that originally was called Let's Tax the Tax Man because the uh, sharks, man. right? The sharks yeah. are called the That's tax man. Um, but since we've um, a lot of that commentary on that page turned into kill all the sharks, and no one wants to do that. They're just so we, they, they changed the name of the group for was a fisherman fighting for marine balance or yeah, something, something to that effect. Um, and is organized by Captain Patrick Price um, up there in Jensen Beach with Daymaker Charters. And if anyone goes on that page, they can see a lot of good information and research that's been done by fishermen is on that page. It's very informational, very informationally speaking. So um, I just wanted to give a shout out because that to me is the leading resource of the fight for anglers is that Facebook page and that group. Um, Patrick Price in particular, and there's others involved, you know, Captain Skip Dana, who's another regular of the show, and, and Art Sapp, and you know, they've been doing really a lot of great work. Rufus Wakeman, who's definitely involved with the CCA, and you know, there's been th members of the CCA that have been gotten, getting behind it. Um, members of the Billfish Foundation have been getting behind it, because quite frankly, the sharks are eating the sailfish that are coming up. Yeah, I mean, quite, is, if I remember correct, there was a ban on the alligators many mm -hmm. years ago, and they decided to reinstate hunting season for the gators for that very reason that they were being destructive to the environment it's no and different than the way they can they out. do deer hunts and the way they, for controlling right. deer populations up north and it's it's the same situation and, and, and i think i speak one second for a lot of fishermen 
we don't like catching sharks. It's not fun. We we, right. we don't go fishing for sharks. That's right. not something that that would be a chore to have right. to go out and go shark fishing because <laughs> you don't really get a lot out of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Captain Chris Lemieux um, was just on the last episode, and he kind of explained. He, he, I think he laid that pretty good. Yeah. Like it's like even though we're allowed to take one bull shark a day, it's like, and it was oh, and some people are like, oh, the people aren't even doing that, so why is it a big deal? It's like you understand what a big pain in the ass it is. Sorry, John. Yeah. yeah. To bring a two hundred pound bull up on board, dangerous. With the way this gets dangerous, the way the, the skin is rough, it just ruins the gel coat on your boat. Those things thrash when they get on there. It's not a good it's, situation. It's dangerous. Dangerous. So to ask people to say let's start doing that, you know, it's a little irresponsible. I, I think not this, everyone can handle. I think that this fish. leads back to um, what we're trying to do with the clean the waterways, where it takes private people. It mm. takes private people with initiative and with love and passion to step up. Mm -hmm. um, government doesn't solve many problems for you in my life. And, and nor, nor should I expect them to. Right. Nor should, I, nor should yeah. we expect them to. And it takes why we created our team mm -hmm. and created our company was we wanted to bring... The, the the rock stars, the greatest, the, the the people that with the knowledge, the guys from Mike Lambricks to Dr. Gregory to people that are out there trying to do something and help Miles and I, you know, put together a dream team of, of people because it took the private initiative to come up with these ideas and plans, right, Dr. Gregory? Yeah, maybe let's formally introduce what we're talking about. Yeah, I think, I think that's the perfect. I think that's organization. I think that's the point. perfect time to do that. Yep. Yeah, for so sure. maybe Miles or. So take me through what you guys got John, going on. It. Well, uh, so John asked me to, uh, you know, come to a couple of meetings early on after we had our pipes breaking. And uh, we ended up with this great team, you know, and we've been working on solutions to help uh, clean the water and also maintain the water. Um, and, you know, we've put together a couple of different things. We can't get into all of them right now in specifics, but um, it was, it was just about looking, reading, digesting what exactly we were facing as far as these pipes breaking. And that's what has led us. That was phase one. And then we've seen, okay, well, we think we can clean these smaller areas. Well, how can we clean a large area? And we've just been going and going and going. And I'll let Dr. Gregory take over as far as the protein skimmer the technology. The protein skimmer technology, yeah. And other technologies, which is fractionation, right? It's right. technically called fractionation. It's physics. It's not chemically based. But it's like a miracle. I mean, so we And this is just one of the solutions. We have numerous that yeah. we're working on. I think we can say talk about the protein skimmer. Yeah, we can talk about that. Talked about because that's been out there. Cats out of the bag. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we I'm I, I hung out in Hawaii for two and a half years. I got a master's degree in aquaculture. Mm -hmm. Big systems, big filtration, but um, using the environment, <laughs> being smart about physics, being smart about electrical usage. And it's amazing. It was like six months ago, Johnny was at these sewage meetings realizing there's something in the water and the best solutions. Almost a year ago. Almost, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the, yeah. So they're trying to figure out how to remove pollution from water without removing all of the water because that was one of the solutions. You just pull everything right. out. Wow. Or waiting for the garbage to settle on the bottom and then pulling it out the thought of that from one. there. and all. I know, it's crazy, right? Wow. But so <laughs> no, here's what the embarrassing part is. The opposite is protein skimming is like cheating. We've used these contraptions to mechanically separate. And desperate times call for desperate measures, well, right? I, I have like 10 of them at a nonprofit that I run to keep the coral happy, keep the water clean. It's an essential part of any high-tech, even low-tech system. You want to grow tilapia indoors, you've got some of these things. Mm -hmm. But the application for the water is um, it's embarrassing to humanity that no one thought of it, but Johnny, Johnny put two and two together and said, "Let's like we've used these for fish before." He's he'd had them in in some capacity. We for were bait growing goggle eye. We were growing goggle eye in a ten thousand gallon pool that I had above ground, 
mm-hmm. and uh, I was studying it, and we were learning how to grow goggle eye, and and uh, we were we were using UV filters and wet dry filters, and, uh, and pound for pound the most expensive fish on the planet. Right, so, and, yeah. and 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 um, Shane Lafanier uh, from Twenty Four Seven Aquariums was like, hey. You know, you really need a protein skimmer, like a, a big one. Like you have a ten thousand gallon pool, like filled with goggle eye, bro. Mm-hmm. He's like, that's a lot of waste and a lot of feed. Um, and so I was like, all right, well, how much do they cost? He's like, oh, they're like forty, fifty grand. I'm like, um, I love goggle eye, yeah, but I don't know if I love goggle eye <laughs> forty or fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Uh, learning about them. So I, I actually, Shane and I got together with John Stevens and we built our own protein skimmer and we learned the, the technology behind it, the physics behind it, and we built one. Um, and it was successful. It removed all the waste out of the, out of the, out of the pool. And so December 21st, after the first sewage break in South Florida, the main sewer break, um, I brought up at a town hall meeting, like, have you guys looked into um, this idea? And they were kind of, you know, didn't know what I was talking about. And uh, at that point, I uh, started putting together a team and to push it and to, to use this technology. And we're talking about moving millions of gallons of water um, Dr. Gregory can explain like bo- bubbles are polar and water. Uh, yeah, definitely point, explain that. I think eventually you're gonna have to explain where all those goggle eye went to all the fishermen in the crowd. But <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone's thinking about well, what you do with all those goggle eye. Uh, so protein skimming, you it's simple. You have a chamber and you inject a lot of water and a lot of bubbles into it. Mm-hmm. The bubbles float up and the water comes. It's allowed to leave after it's interfaced with the bubbles. And all of the pollution that's in the water at least gets to contact the bubbles. And most pollution is actually nonpolar. Oils and lipids and fish wastes and stuff like that. A lot of the bacteria, a lot of the algae even, wants to stick to bubbles. And what happens is the bubbles all floating up to the top accumulate a slimy layer like sea foam. And eventually they pile on each other so much they actually physically, they physically separate themselves. You exclude them by them overflowing into a separate container. And they vaporize? Now you collect the sludge. It, it's, you collect it's, it, right? It's, yeah, but it's concentrated. Right. So if every you know thousand gallons go through, you get a gallon. It's of called skimmy. 50% pure junk along with 50% water. Um, or even better, depending on how slimy the bubbles are, how much water you're injecting, and how polluted the water is in the first place. So this, so this is a solution of cleaning up the mess. It pulls it out. It pulls so much out. It pulls bacteria. Yeah. Literally right. pulls coliform straight out, pulls oils, petroleum products, gasoline, all sorts of old. Um, so and and what's the byproduct? You get oxygenated water. Really? Yeah. So on the first pass, it pulls 50% of garbage out. Second pass, 75% of garbage out. So <sighs> you close off, say there's an, an, a, a septic spill or an oil spill or whatever. You can close off right where it's leaking into the water, put a big protein skimmer in it or outside of it, pulling it out. And sure that you're mopping up very okay. well so i have questions okay. yes and you that's, know, just, that's just the tip of the iceberg we're cleaning the water but at simultaneously we're putting fresh water back oxygen oxygenated so then at that point well, once this process the- happens then it's just really on the rest of us to like sustain it correct well, right? and maintain it and us, right. us to keep this is something it would be like uh you know you sweep your house every sounds like, few days. It, I mean, it's, I it's amazing. It, I mean, it well, that's like my, my favorite analogy like is, the is the dirty dishes, right? You got the, the college dorm room, all the dirty dishes. No one's done the dishes forever. Or my house. Yeah. <laughs> Mine too sometimes. <laughs> your, aunt, your Aunt Caroline comes over to visit and goes, oh, my Lord. Yeah. You clean the place spotless. <laughs> and she says to you, if you wash your dishes every night, it'll never get that dirty again. Right. And so, yeah, we have our initial cleaning that we have to do but if we get it right and we stay on it we should be able to keep at at a much healthier level and yeah you know this team putting it together we're taking things that have been used and proven in large scale areas i mean some of this stuff is at uh, 
places like Sea World. I mean, we're talking major Dubai leagues. Aquarium, right? Mm-hmm. Major league, two hundred million gallons. Aquariums. So we're basically just treating treating our waterways like an aquarium, then. which we should. Yeah, we should. That's so, so is. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. We're yeah. we're kind of like breaking some intel here, right? Or we, are, we are, we are, we are, we are breaking some intel. Um, I mean, we haven't spoken. To, you know, there's a lot more to our plan than what we're talking about. Um, I'm sure there is. Yeah, and there's no doubt about it. I mean, and and quite frankly, I think for the general population of the show, yeah. they, they they just want to get the Fisher Price version, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, for the most part, I mean, now it's important to understand the science of it. That most people, it's gonna like go over their heads and they go, oh, I just want, you know what I mean. But for people like us on the show, we get into it, um, and we want to understand all the nuances of it and everything like that. So you guys can take that as deep as you want or need to take it at okay. that point. So well, just don't feel free to hold. Don't, we ha- don't we, mind we have back. a rock star in Dr. Gregory. I who, see that who who is incredibly knowledgeable, <laughs> and he's a very humble guy too. And he cares about kids. I mean, he donates 20 hours a week to nonprofit to teach children. Mm -hmm. Okay. He cares. All right. And we care. And you care. Mm -hmm. I mean, half of it is is like caring about and being passionate about what you're trying to do. If you do something without passion, you know, it's soulless. Like we talked about the soulless lures. Okay. Right. right. Which Moisey, Andy Moisey and I talk about. There's a lure that has soul to it. And there's a lure that is soulless. Mm -hmm. And, um... What we're trying to do has soul and and it has passion and it has love and we we're lucky enough to have a guy like Dr. Gregory to and it us. has science and it has yeah. science. And there's science. Thank you. Yeah, Thank science. you. Science and and it has science. It's science. Good. And science. a lot of hard work. <laughs> a um, lot of hard work. A lot of uh, yes. We a lot spent, of research and due diligence. We spent a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of hours um, getting to where we're at. It, this has not been something that we just came off the cuff with. Are yeah. you able to share where we're at with the process? At the moment. Research and development. Research and development. Well, okay. we should be, we're hoping to be somewhere in the next couple months. Yes. Uh, we're, in action. Okay. We, we're, we're essentially building out the... Um, system. System, yeah. Uh, right now. And we'll be able to... You mean to design a logo? Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Perhaps, yes. Perhaps. That could, that could tell I could contribute. Yes. To that in the podcast. So <laughs> we, we have... Let's just call it, for the lack of a better term, miniature models. Okay. okay? We're going to have a full-scale model that we're building ourselves. Okay. Um, and we're working with a lot of awesome companies around the country that have the parts we need to do it. I'm being a little vague, but. Sure. But we'll have a full-scale model in the first quarter. Um, and, and we've worked with all the uh, necessary, we're, we're working closely with all the necessary government regulatory agencies Mm -hmm. because everybody thinks it's so simple to to just do something like this and you don't realize how many government agencies are involved and you don't also realize that there's um most of you you think it's tough to pull a permit try doing something like this right (laughs) yeah Yeah. And, and 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 what people don't realize is that most of these government bodies don't get along together that great no, they really don't. So, really. Yeah. yeah. We found that out. <laughs> so, they don't. You would think they would because it would make their job easier, but they right. just don't. And it's like a dysfunctional family. You know, when you deal with the state, the county, the city, the all the different regulatory agencies. They're all, in, is it because they're all fighting for funding? Is it? No, in, it's in just. The, why do you think that is? Culture? Well, it there is some funding fighting, but then it's, you know, in different administrations come and go. But it's not all, there are all these little tiny uh, positions and organizations in there, right? And so, you know, when you have someone with a different philosophy, a different administration come in, now that changes, but then they're out and then another guy comes in. So for them to develop a standard, I suppose, for doing things, they don't really have necessarily... uh, maybe a standard for doing things. Um, but, you know, I don't want to critique them too much because there's been a lot of people oh, yeah. well, I mean, I'm not government about throwing that, anyone that, under that the that bus. super not helpful. No, yes, I, we've been... We've we're had, not trying to throw them we, under We've the gotten bus. tremendous support from every government agency and every, every government body that we've met with. We have gotten tremendous support. See, that doesn't surprise me at all, and I'll tell you why. Because it sounds like you guys have... A, 
real good tactile solution to the problem, right? And that's going to make everyone's lives in Florida government, especially so much easier if this just gets taken care of, right? I would think. Yeah. Now, I'm sure there's there's other people that stand to have, like, their agendas that they were moving forward with knocked down and they want to see their solution come mm-hmm. to fruition and probably not as good of a solution, but they worked real hard on it and they don't want to see it die. No one wants to see their hard work And neither die. do we. Yeah. There, there's, there, this is just pieces to the puzzle. Right. right. There's a there's hundred pieces to the puzzle. Mm-hmm. We've, yeah. we've got a handful of them. Okay? And I want to say to anybody who okay. has a solution out there, um, you're going to be a part of it because it's going to take a lot Right, a lot of different solutions to to really to really get this hammered out. You know, uh, our thing, you know, is hopefully going to have a humongous impact in our intercoastal waterways, okay. But hopefully, it'll also inspire people to you know think about, hey, you know, look what they're doing. I have this idea, maybe this will work, and it's going to take that. It's going to take a lot of brains and minds. But to I to recommend talk, talk, take action. You're right. Yeah. yeah, it's going to take that. It and, is. And, and take action. Don't be a keyboard warrior. Don't don't correct. Don't, don't don't be someone that just bashes people or or just talks crap online. Like take action. Mm-hmm. You, want, you want to do something? CCA like, is a great organization to get involved with. Yes, I. Agree. If anyone wants it, I think I I would think I would actually. You know what? I'm going to promote that. If you want to get involved with an organization where you can help today, go talk to the CCA, please. Yeah. And Mike right. Lambrex is Absolutely. part of our. We yeah. have to disclose if that Mike Lambrex part of our company. Yeah, yeah. Who's he's part. But but the, I mean, you can separate the two in this circumstance. Absolutely. You know Absolutely. what I mean. And and if you're in Broward, which most of the people listening to our show are, but we got a lot of people all over South Florida listening to the show. Um, you know, all over the world, but mostly. I mean, this is mostly a Florida show. Um, get involved with the CCA, call them up. They'd be more than happy to accept your help. I know that for a fact because they need help. Right, mm-hmm. they really, they really do. They need volunteers. They need people to help with coastal research, um, and you know they need to help people to help with fisheries research and, and and the entire aspect of what we're talking about. There aren't many people, and I can give this credit to to Miles because when I came to him with this idea and we started talking, that put their money and their actions where their mouth is, mm-hmm. and. Um, this has been a tremendous investment that we've had to, to, to do, um, Mm -hmm. to get to where we're at. And I can't say enough about miles being supportive and helping making this, this, this happen because without him, without any of us, without Dr. Gregory, without Shane, without Mike Lambrex, without John Millage, without the team, it takes, you got to put together a great team and then, you know, you gotta, it, it, Things aren't free. And, right. and, 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 no. well, and you I mean, gotta take listen, chances in life. And so I wanna I wanna say this, right? So we started off the show talking about the history of Florida, which everyone in this room is proud of, right? Um, you know. But it's important, I think, to really truly get the right perspective on what we're dealing with is to take some time and give yourself a little bit of a history lesson on our state because it's really, really important because we're in 2020 and we talked about what the early 1900s, 1903, I think you said, right. And that's really when, because everything before that, I mean, you you know, was, was, wasn't much. And, you know, it was all, like you said, it it was all native American Indian land and uh, it was all gator country and, and and the whole, you know, it was, we're building, we're building, we're building railroads on sand. It's, it, it was, it wasn't really, you know what I mean? It was yeah. far from so developed. Far Lots from developed. Acres. So let's just call that quickly 120 years of Florida history, yeah. right? And in 120 years' time, look where this state has come, right? And it's tremendous. And if you look at you cannot get coastal property here at all, right? And you look at the amount of impervious surfaces and concrete slabs that are creeping their way into the center of the state, right? Mm-hmm. And then if you look at you know, where we are environmentally speaking in this state and how did we get there in 120 years time? And like now is the time to address all this because I got news for you. We've discussed this on this show before too. 
that you look at all the sewer outbreaks that happen in Fort Lauderdale. Well, that's Fort Lauderdale, right? That's going to start happening to the Melbournes. It's, it's starting already, to happen. It's already to the, happening. To the, there, there's, to the Fort Myers, to Tampa. It's starting seepage. to happen all over the place. There's seepage that's already happening everywhere. Right. Everywhere we've tested, we've seen similar results, mm-hmm. even though they haven't had major breaks. Right. Everywhere we've gone and tested where you wouldn't expect right. to have this problem, the problem's there. Yeah, so and, so what, the, what I'm saying is basically, like, when they built Florida, right, you're not building Manhattan on granite, number one. Right, and you're building things cheaply and quickly to get all those snowbirds down here for half a, a year. Yeah, like that's really what that's really what our idea of Florida was predicated upon. Right, right, for better or worse. Okay, it's developed our culture over time, and it is what we are. All right, yeah. no problem. I fully accepted that. But where do we go from here? Yeah, we weren't set up to be a major metropolis. You know. I, right. Just being a native of Fort Lauderdale, it's, mm-hmm. this was a beach town. This was not. This was meant to be a town. It's, it, it was not. It's unrealistic to, be, to think we can go backwards, though. And, well, and we, we're, not gonna go, we're not. We're not going to be. We're able not going to go backwards. We, we we have to remove. I mean, uh, the basic idea of what we're trying to do is we have to remove this stuff from the water, mm-hmm. and the ocean shouldn't like be first things first. Like, yeah. And, 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 and you, you know, we, there can be debate about how much flushing occurs, tidal flushing and on what levels and on what water columns it happens. But at the end of the day, our goal is to remove it. You have to remove it, the, the bad stuff out of the water. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, with, through all of our testing, we've seen like our, ecosystem is so out of balance like we'll sit there and watch when it's not supposed to happen a nine a nine point change in salinity in 45 minutes when there's no rain there's no anything happening and we're testing waters it's, and right, it's tides that, coming tides coming in and salinity's going down down yeah mm-hmm. like just that things that are like, so wow. out of whack and and our ecosystem is just not we're dealing with a very fra- an ecosystem that's in danger, and then the testing is showing us that it is so up and down. I mean, it's like anyone that, that that's a bait guy knows that, like, hey, when the rain comes, you you sink your pins, yeah, right? Deeper, yeah. You get your you get yeah. the, the, the the fresh water floats down the on the bottom of the intercoastal. Yeah, the, yep. the fresh water floats. You know, is is more buoyant, so it sits on the su- surface. And when you got you know bait, you you know and you sink it, you mm-hmm. know, because it's got a better salinity level. But now you have more pollution on the bottom. So now you're dealing with settling. Because it's settling. Like, yeah. look what happened in Miami. I mean, that was unbelievable. That was atrocious. Okay. I mean, that should be the wake up <laughs> yeah. call of all wake up calls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that was in your face as it gets right there. That was, I mean, at that point, you got, was it Louis Aguirre or whatever, doing like his little yeah, news Louis reports Aguirre. and, yeah. you know, and the whole, you know, like expo, like mini series on the whole Biscayne Bay and let's save our bay. And once yeah. it gets to that point where you got, <laughs> no offense to Louis Aguirre, right? But, you know, he's a reporter. He's not like indigenously involved in understanding, you know what I mean, the nuances of everything about it. He's just reporting this and he's getting information and he's reporting it. He probably sees he's human. He sees with his own eyes what's going on. But when you got guys like that doing mini series on, you know, Save Our Bay, we got a problem, man. Like we got a big problem. Like if that's the first time like the general masses of our South Florida population is really, it's really hitting home with them. Like we've known about these problems for years. Yeah. Right. But if this, that's the first time that people are really getting the big story, that's a problem. It is a problem. Well, you know, and I don't, I can't control, you know, the journalists and the media. It's what they choose to hyper focus on. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, it would be a benefit for everyone to well, look well, my, into their my, local yeah, politics. My point and, and is like, hey, wow, it got to that point. You right. know what I mean? It got to that point. Yeah. Where they that, feel like they needed to do a whole thing. Yeah. You know? A little, you know, a little late. But I mean, most people who love the water, who spend time on the water, they're knowledgeable about it. The ordinary person who, you know, isn't an enthusiast. They, they don't know. I mean, 
a lot of folks came up to me after the Miami thing and they were like, wow, you know, I mean, every time I drive over the bridge, the water just looks so bright and welcoming and wonderful. Like how, how, how could neon, you know, how did you guys do they, that? They, they looked, you know, and, and the water in Fort Lauderdale is all Brown. And I said, well, guys, hold on. It's always Brown because we dug out the mangroves. It's not, it's a different bottom in Miami. And now we have Brown on the bottom for different reasons, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, because we did dredge the mangrove way, way back in the day. That's why the water's brown. But yeah, in that bay. And so that opened up a lot of people's eyes to think that something bad could happen in water that looks that gorgeous. And yeah, oh yeah, it can, you know. And uh, I, I hear people talking about it more and more. And, and I think we need to continue to, I hope people will do more reports and more stories because we need to continue to get the word out there and keep people passionate about it so they can, at the very least, you know, donate to the organizations that are taking a lead mm -hmm. in, in fixing these problems, you know? Yeah. I mean, that is true. I mean, I look at guys like you in this room now and I'm like, you know, I can only think that anyone watching this show or, you know, listening to it is like, all right, cool. They got the answer. These guys are on the case. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, hope right. So. Yeah, exactly. hope so. Right. But you know, the reality is it's like, yeah, you're on the case and we need guys like you. And it's, a, you know, super important players and super important cogs in the wheel of this entire situation. But, you know, as John alluded to it earlier, you know, it's going to take everybody's cooperation. It's going to take everybody changing their habits and, yeah. um, you know, and, and everyone kind of like really taking a new perspective on what we are as a land and as a people. Yeah, right. Yeah. And yeah. People have to start contributing. And even if it's contributing their time in educating themselves about this stuff, so right. they know about it. So, so they can tell other people about it. Mm -hmm. You know, every, every dollar helps. So they say, you know, the, as, as the saying goes and, and, and that goes up here and it comes sure from the wallet, if you're going to donate to an organization, but it, it's, it's, it's a big help when everyone, is at least informed it can all talk about it because then it creates momentum and and hopefully we're a part of a momentum that starts in a positive direction for for our waterways and that can translate throughout the state yep absolutely like there's there's a couple funny things and it, i think it relates all to what we've been talking about the environment itself when we strive forward it's usually because some cataclysm happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so there's been a build up of nutrient, there's been a die off of Plutons. coral, of, pl of pollutants, pollutants, of seagrass. But it's when we hit these of thresholds, the perfect. <laughs> when there's a threshold met and a, a bacteria or a, an algae blooms, or all seagrass dies, or all fish die from anaerobic conditions, no oxygen in the water, that's when people get fired up. That's when you've got the news jumping Louis, in Louis. and making a big deal, and they get excited, and people get excited in general. And I feel like there's an analogy on the other side where you've got a lot of people simmering, working towards it, doing little things, getting an electric vehicle, cutting down on their plastic. But when crazy things happen, like post hurricane or um, there's an ice bucket challenge or like a new governor comes in who really wants to take care of business, you get the big steps and they pave the way so that everyone can easily follow. And sad that it takes a cataclysm or like a, a revolutionary to do that. But I really think that what we need to be doing is trying to mitigate the cataclysms, but at the same time, promote the revolutionaries. Yeah. In talking mm -hmm. about government, this is the greatest thing That's about point. this is the greatest thing is that this is a bi this is a bipartisan issue. Mm -hmm. There's bipartisan support for this. I mean, uh, we have we have a great governor in Ron DeSantis who cares deeply about the yep. water. We've got lot. We've got uh, local mayors and and local people who are on the other side of the aisle that care deeply about it. You know, I mean, um, I can speak from the conservative side. You got your your Brian Masts and your Chip Lamarcus that do an outstanding job on this on a daily basis. And then you got other. Uh, I don't. I'm not going to mention names or drop names, but there's yeah. there's lots of um, people on the other side of the aisle that that care deeply about this as well. Mm -hmm. And that's what's um, very rarely do you have um, bipartisan support for an issue. It's a rare thing, especially in today's divisive mm -hmm. world. My, my background, the coral, it's my favorite thing. Coral is so important. I, I didn't do this by on purpose. It happened by accident, but 
if now to look back as a, I'm a veterinarian, I'm a marine biologist, I love animals, I'm in a very good spot to do what I think needs to be done for mm-hmm. conservation. I have the Reef Institute, nonprofit up in Palm Beach. We grow coral. I've got tons of Pacific coral, an army of aquarists, and but also teach children. And mm-hmm. and a big part of it is teaching children. So it, there's actually a trifecta. It's conservation through like education, research, kid. and restoration. Right? We've got Atlantic corals that we're protecting, but my interface between the community state as a whole and all of our political bodies and other nonprofits in it and educational institutions. It's amazing. We are moving forward with big solutions. Department of environmental protection is communicating with department of environmental resource management is communicating with, communicating with fish and wildlife, three or four big universities, three or four big aquariums, three or four big nonprofits all doing it in synchrony that makes that gives me a little bit of hope mm-hmm. that we're going to build a reef back so that 20 years from now this guy can actually catch a grouper or a snapper instead of you know a muck fish instead of right. you know garbage so i'm loving that the florida i want to say ecosystem for both the, the biology and the human aspect can all come together no matter what side you're on of the aisle no matter socioeconomically where we're coming from and cherish the resource enough to realize that there's a problem and to get past the silly stuff and do it. Just like we're mobilized fast and hard for the Bahamas, just like we're saving the coral reefs, the intercoastal is in our face. Johnny the fourth can't get in and paddleboard for crying out loud. Yeah. We need to fix that. And right. I think we are now at a time where politicians statewide and local all the government agencies, educational groups, nonprofits, and initiative takers. This guy who has the kid who needs to have this guy who cares about this, the foremans or the edif- the edifice family of, you mm-hmm. know, the environment. Let's take care of business. I, here, here. Absolutely. Here, here. Wow. That was phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> that was, you laid it out, my brother. <laughs> okay, I guess we need to have another uh, yeah, yeah, cool. I'm gonna find so the final now, now toast, we're, right? We're going to get to the final, uh, or the, the, the final. You see, you, why, final. you see why I called Dr. Dr. Yeah, yeah. Gregory the rock star? Absolutely. We need to, we need to have, um, we need to have some offline conversations because I got some wheels turning. Scheming. Yeah. Uh, I, I think some he, things he, that he, connected he, by water can do we'll maybe happily, with the Reef Institute. I'm we'll, a schemer. We'll, I think it would be phenomenal. We will happily come back on. Um, as this project grows, do you want to pass that on? Home? I don't think you gave him enough. Okay. Well, <laughs> He's like, whoa. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know what he wanted. Don't pour uh, me light. Don't pour me all light. Don't pour me light. Don't pour me light. Oh, man. That's, <laughs> that'd make a good t shirt. Don't, <laughs> don't pour me light. You, you ready for I'm not going to hand that to Johnny. I'm not going to hand that to Johnny. We're going to keep that one away from Johnny. <laughs> so, speaking of Johnny, we got three Johns in the room. I got John over here. He's been a little quiet today because um, I, I think, you, I, so yeah, much. he doesn't have a mic. He do not mic. That's why I'm wondering why John's not talking today. And so, but anyway, so this has been great, great commentary yeah. today. Um, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed by the way this is all going. Um, we got a bucket here on a table. Uh, for those of you not uh, watching on uh, YouTube or on our website and just listening to audio, I have a bucket full of crabs here. Let's get let's get a little Johnny. He's been handling these guys. So, right, Johnny, you want to yank it? Come, come on over here. Yoke a crab out of here. And, right. and, and Dr. Gregory, why don't you explain them, I'm right? laughing. Yeah. They're, my, they're my crabs, but I, I love the idea of my story to tell through <laughs> Johnny Losa's Los's commentary. What, what did I tell you? Why do I have these crabs today? All right, so you have these crabs because they're algae eaters. Yeah. The, the crabs are algae eaters, and your friend in the Whoa. Keys. Can they fight you? And your, no, you no, and your no, friend no. in the Keys needed help with one of his tanks or one of his... his, his has I'm um, guessing an overburdens of algae, um, and that's why you're. We brought him inside. <laughs> I'm imagining. I'm like, dying. I'm imagining I'm like, not like, not like a bad <laughs> scene from a movie yeah. about to happen here. It's just like, hey, the, like an Austin awesome power scene. Oh, there is something interesting. <laughs> we're all gonna get. We're all gonna end up with crap. There is something nose. interesting scientific. <laughs> scientific that I think we that, that I think we missed, and I wanted I, I wanted to bring this up, and I, we, yeah. we kind of yeah. did, Doctor Gregory. Yeah, sure. put the crab there. Yeah. Science. Yeah, put them on the paper. This is for education and science. You can put them on the bill, too, if you want. Don't matter. Yeah. All right, so, doc, no, you're good. They're, they're, like, Get he the told you, they're, they're slow, they're slow pinchers. 
So just as long as you're quick. Um, yo, hands, though, man, he's just looking at he's so looking Dr. at me. Gregory, can you please explain why we're doing this? Okay, this is actually a big part of the big picture too. Okay, bioremediation. These are animals that we use. In aquarium systems, but if you encourage them in the environment, if you create a structure for them to survive, they, yeah, right now the reefs are, are worn down from the pollution that's going out into the ocean. Too much phosphorus. Instead, we're growing cyanobacteria. Inland waterways are worn down. Right. So the natural stuff that does it can't survive. And, and reefs and mangroves mm-hmm. are a fishery or a, a, a nursery for all these little animals. And these animals, in so being sheltered, go. can then go, go. out. And you got two or three at the same time there? What do you... Wow. I see what you've done. There we go. I see what there you've you done. Go. All right. <laughs> Let's be gentle on him. So, him as vicious as this guy looks, he's got the little cups at the end of his pinchers. What's he's the name of that eater. crab? What's the name of that crab? This, this crab. is Mythrax sculpinus. It's the emerald crab. This is a big male. You don't okay. like these in your fish tank because they take your coral and throw them over their shoulders. Wait, wait, say that again. Say the name again. The emerald crab. Emerald crab. And, uh, and again, the fancy I'm, name. The fancy name. Mythrax sculpinus. It's in the spider crab family. So this is in the same family. It's a small version of those big channel cling crabs you see on the walls here and in the keys. You get enough of these in your fish tank, though. You don't have bubble algae. You don't have hair algae. You have no algae because they take care of business, right? The same could be said for the environment. If you give them a place, give them some algae, they'll eat it. They clean the environment so that... Coral and tunicates and worms and sponges can all do what they're supposed to do for the coral reef. Can we talk about, we, I, I meant, we, we got into this a little bit, but when we were taking the samples of the two and a half gallon buckets. Well, like, Johnny, you're ridiculous. Just grab them. I love it. Just grab them. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to get, yeah, look, this is a bit. real, this yeah, is a real go. emerald. Yeah. Okay, I'm colorblind. So this is a green one. Yeah, that's green. And this is like a brown or a red. red yeah. Really? There is the red emerald oh, that's crab. A, that's like a dark. Yeah, okay. like a red. That's like a lobster color red, like yeah, a main lobster <laughs> after you boil them. When we have big hands, you can just grab them. Yeah. But you get the little fingers, man. You get, Johnny doesn't yeah. want to get bit. He's so like, I ain't sure <laughs> about these guys. Yes, they're, they don't bite you, though. They just like... You want to hook them up? You want to go catch some permit? Put your hand down. I want to put this, plop them back in the bucket. I can't reach. Okay. Oh, man. He's a clean crab. He's going to grab. Okay, great. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got just it. pick him up. Need some water. Okay. All right, they're durable animals as well. Exoskeleton invertebrate. <laughs> That was, abusing, that was good. We're not abusing crabs. Have you, ever had, have, you had, have you ever had live crabs on your show before? That was the, the first time. Wow. I think right. that was actually the first time we've ever had anything live in the room. All right, right. so what I wanted to talk about... Andy Moyes brought some live ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the only live that we had on the That doesn't surprise me. Champions League. All right, um, what I did want to talk about <laughs> is... is uh, puts it right on the table. Is, I'm like, oh, okay, that's how we're going to roll out with the podcast today. That we did some testing at first mm-hmm. when we first started testing. And Dr. Gregory came to me and he said, "This the water's testing weird. It should be showing something different. And he said, let me try something, Johnny. And he took these buckets that we had collected, right? These two and a half gallon buckets of water. And he put them in a dark closet for what, seven days? Yeah, but you could get the same in two or three. Two or three days. And he tested the water before he put he he before he put them in the in the closet. And then he tested them seven days or however many days later. And it was like a thousand times higher, the pollutants. And I said, Dr. Gregory, what, how does that make sense? How did it go from water testing one way to Seven days later, that same bucket of water testing a thousand times higher. And please explain. Look, that's your perspective story. My perspective is, I said, I'm going to test it, and there's no nutrients in it at first. Watch this. Give me seven days. Okay, you're right. He knew what he was doing. I didn't know. There was a journey for Johnny Lowe's here. So it's all tied up in the animals. It's tied up in the plants. It's tied up in bacteria. And so it's a time bomb. If you create an imbalance in the ecosystem, a big rainstorm, a little bit of pollution, or you cut oxygen all together, you're going to kill something, and that'll cascade. So, so the layman explanation is basically that the the pollutants or the plutrients. Yeah, I was going to say you keep saying nutrients, uh, yeah, you keep pl- saying pl- pollutants. That's yeah, what yeah, I was looking uh, at. Uh, him, the pollutants, like, so uh, uh, neutral pollutants. <laughs> <laughs> the pollutants get tied up in the micro microbacteria and the microalgaes. Mm-hmm. And then when you have a high change in salinity or a drastic 
temperature change or a numerous amount of things that can happen. Yep. Um, I've learned from this guy. You know, yeah. I, 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 I listen. We all can. I listen. My 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 fiance would say I don't, but Dr. Yeah. Gregory will say I, I listen. Uh, he doesn't listen. <laughs> I, can attest, I, can, I can attest for that. He picks up what he wants to pick up, and this is relevant stuff. And, and so Dr. Gregory told taught me that the pollutants hide in the microalgae and the in the microbacteria. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to test the water, you wouldn't see them. You would just see the microalgae and the regular bacteria. So this is microbiology. Is it really? They do, and the, the, when they're doing the tests at Okeechobee, for example, yeah. they do what I did. They okay. they they let it settle out. They break it out of its shell, so to speak, and then they test it to see what the nitrogen is at. Okay, but and it's through, it's there. It, it, it's, it went through the roof. It's gross. It went through the roof, and that's what probably led to the fish kill type of stuff, right? In in, yeah. in the bay, is that. All of a sudden, all these things are tied up in the microalgae and the microbacteria that are alive, and then something happens. Water temperature, salinity, something happens, and those microbacteria and microalgae die mm -hmm. and release all the pollutants, um, our coined word, mm -hmm. um, all at once, yeah. which then uh, fuel the cyanobacteria. Right, a couple different other bad things and, can and, happen and, from there. And, and then you have a catastrophe like the Biscayne Bay fish Deplete kill. Deplete oxygen. Yep. Right. Bad and things grow, toxins are produced, so oxygen it's, it's, depleted. It, they're not, it's not that, it's not, it's not as easy as people think. And right. there's a lot of knowledge you have to gain by doing these type of tests and trying these experiments and doing these models. And we've been doing it with Dr. Think. Let me ask you a I question. thank the Lord for Dr. Gregory because he's yeah, a rock should, star. You should, for sure. And let, me, let me ask you thanks, a question. Guys. <laughs> you, you said like other government organizations are helping and everything. It's a bipartisan issue. Everyone's crossing over the aisle to help out and all that. And you guys are doing your own amazing research and finds and, and all that stuff. Have you found that there are, you're sharing information with other organizations or other private organizations that are doing it on your your own with some of your findings. And I only say that, like, I understand you guys are trying to like, you don't want to muddy the water with all the progress that you've been making. Right. But like, are there other, other, let me see if I can phrase this the right way. Cause I, I don't want to say this the wrong way or come, come off the okay. wrong way. Um, are there other organizations that are giving bad science that, and you don't have to obviously name names that are, that are really not helping and really making things worse than, what they could be or should be. Can I do this one as a quick yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely. Things like water keepers and surf rider are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They're working well with all the politics and their nonprofits. They're looking, but their resources are limited. So they're only looking at a couple beaches, looking at coliform bacteria, reporting to everybody. There's a website you can look any given week. It gives you a green, yellow, or red light for all the beaches in South Florida. Mm -hmm. They're doing a fantastic job. And they're working with some local governments to ramp up understanding of what's going on. At the same time, government agencies are underfunded, and they're doing the best they can. They're taking samples where they can, especially during crisis situations. DEP has just funded major funding to try to come up with a solution for Biscayne Bay, not just the seagrass die-off that's been ongoing, but the fish kill that happened last, uh, within the last year. They're doing as the best they can. What we're proposing to do is the solution-based stuff. It would be awesome to work with all these groups don't reinvent the wheel. Utilize their sets. We've already reached out. But at the end of the day, if you can track coliforms to their source, right? You test every day instead of once a week. Ten different places instead of one spot. 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. We've got some, we've got some technology that's live. We can alter it from the phone, right? It's amazing. We can find the outfalls, the bottlenecks, where the sewage break is, the sneaky one that no one knew was there, mm -hmm. or... The, where the drainage all comes to one spot. We know some of these It's spots. almost kind of like a heat map. Yes, yeah, it's right? a heat map. And we're putting our skim, our technologies in the bottleneck. But we've spent a lot of money to gain this knowledge yep. and, and a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And we're a little protective of it. Um, I should at, be. No, yeah, I wasn't. I didn't want to. I want to just make sure that, you know, to my point in bringing up that question yes. was to just kind of just say, hey, this is the way, like Mandalorian style. You know what I mean? And like this Tiny is Yoda. this is the way. And there is going to be others out there that think they know the way, but they don't have it yet. You know, and and, and I think that's could be counter 
um, productive. We're ahead of the game, right? and we've been working on this, and yeah. we put together an amazing team, uh, as I said before. And uh, What's so refreshing, when we reach out to DEP, the specific people in Department of Environmental Research's Fish and Wildlife, I've worked a lot already with the nonprofit, and the things we've gone for, slightly separate avenues, the ones that are in charge of water management and whatnot, they're awesome. We mm-hmm. tell them skimmer, and they go, I had a fish tank 10 years ago. Skimmers yeah. are brilliant. Yeah, let's make this happen. And they're rooting for it. They're loving the idea. When the paperwork comes down, that's where we're looking at different jurisdictions and Venn diagrams of, mm-hmm. you know, what the policy of this and this are. But it's been amazing in terms of our interface with some progressive permit Take, writing. So you guys are looking, looking at both um, freshwater environments as well? Yes. Skimming doesn't work as well in fresh, but we've been testing and you can you can integrate a lot of the other tech that we're talking about. He doesn't want to tell you how to do freshwater protein skimming because he's figured it out. Yeah, yeah. I know I'm not asking that. Yeah, I'm, how dare I'm, you. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not asking in the general sense. But I'm like, are, are we going to cross over to like like Lake O help and, yes. and Everglades help and, yes. and all that? All right? of it. God, all of it. God, God willing, it's yes. not just our intercoastal. Our, goal, our, like, yeah. our goal is the whole country. Uh, the canals are amazing as a solution to bottleneck because you mm. can process all the water trucking through a canal. Yeah, it like sets our, it up for like you. Like all our sea canals and everything. The, the infrastructure is right. failing countrywide. Yeah. It's not, and, and it's not just failing in coastal areas. It's failing in, in inland areas. Right. And those are affecting lakes. Those are affecting man-made lakes. Those like Flint are f- circumstances and things like the Michigan uh, circumstances? Uh, uh, like I, Flint, I can't speak. Yeah. I'm not educated well, enough. Well, I'll just say this. just to What we're developing is something that can be applied anywhere, you know, mm-hmm. once we, you know, get it to where we need it to go. I mean, this this... We're doing it for the purpose of the intercoastal waterways right now. Yes, that's what we're obviously focused on because that's what's in front of us mm-hmm. and where we live and kind of what the task that we've agreed to take on. But we're South as, Florida boys. As yeah. as I was saying earlier, we're we're looking to use these innovations to be able to yeah, put in anywhere, be mm. it on top of a mountain, in a lake, in an ocean. In an intercoastal, yeah, I don't see why not. They're they're adaptive, and, and we're scalable. sharing we're sharing one tenth of what we have planned, uh, mm-hmm. because we have to. Um, we want to. Yeah, no, I'm yeah, I'm not asking he, you to. He, no, to, I know you're not. Yeah. I'm just trying to explain that we had that, that there is a lot to our. Um, yeah, and, and and I'm excited. In our platform, really. I mean, I'm excited to bring you guys back another time, and and when we can when we can reveal more of it, you know, and, and, and release more of it. Yeah. And having a guy like Dr. Gregory working on this, what when we start to actually when when the rubber meets the road, and mm-hmm. we we start to actually do this, having someone like Dr. Gregory and Shane Lafreniere and other experts in the field, uh, there's lots of guys that he's connected with. Um, and women that will help keep growing what we're trying to do mm-hmm. and grow the knowledge. It, the research, the R and D is going to be continuous. Mm-hmm. So we're our R and D is where it's at right now, and we think we can make an incredible, impactful difference. But where we think we can be in five years is a hundred times that, mm-hmm. because we believe that the more we get out there and and and, and actually start doing the work, the more knowledge we're going to gain, the more understanding we're going to gain, the more impact we can have. We can't and we, wait. We to... want we want to make it back like the I nineteen. Like this we want to make future. it back like we want to make it back. After like, this conversation, I feel like there is, there's, there's we can't more hope wait to get the data back yeah. from the full scale system. Right. We, we can't want, wait to get that you know going and, and up and running and the, the big we're, picture. We're, yeah. We're, so many people say, "How is this possible?" It's an overwhelming challenge. But we're not, we're not we as, human, as humans, we build high-speed rails and skyscrapers and whatnot. This is a little one. The Panama Canal. Yeah. We mm-hmm. built the Panama Canal. Yeah. If we yeah. can do that. So when it comes right down to it, we have fleets of garbage trucks. We could have fleets of barges that treat the water. If we have a few very specific fire trucks for putting out fires, we absolutely have the technology to adapt this to putting out oil spills Fish kill, reoxygenate. The fish would literally line up under these things because it's oxygenated clean water. Mm-hmm. They know how to get there. And if 
everything else goes crazy, we can find new technology to address that that problem. And are working on that at the yeah. time. And, and are working on that currently. And, and we just have so many people that hear what we're doing and are excited about it. I think there's the potential for the momentum, both grassroots, and that's a big part of what. It's a grassroots. Mike Lambrex thing. does with CCA. Yeah. The technology we've got. Shane Lefrenier who's built a bunch of big systems. He's got the maintenance protocols. He knows how to run the computers. And then we've got uh, just these guys who can bring the big game to the table to take care of business fast. Mm -hmm. the, the the world changers, the uh, <laughs> instigators, the influencers, the influencers. Man, solid, John. My well, we, solid. Thanks we for having us on, yeah, man. We care, and we promise. I owe it to my children. I owe it to your. We all do. I, I owe you it to your children. kids. Yeah. All right. I owe it to Miles' kids. I owe it to everybody's kids. And I take this as something that is, uh, it, it's something I won't let go. Right. You're and doing I, it for the intrinsic value of it, you, and, and that's 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 really the the big point. My heart's right? in it. My yeah. heart's in it, and and I won't give up. And I'll do just like when I went to the Bahamas. I was going. I was going to help people. Yeah. The waterways. Guess what? I'm going. Mm -hmm. There ain't. There is nothing stopping me, or us. And we've got the greatest team we've assembled. And if there's other people we can add to it, we will. Right. And you know why? If there's other people we can work with, we will. Do you know why? We're all connected by water. We are indeed. We're all connected, connected by, by water. water man. Right? Connected. Yeah, man. And I really appreciate you giving us uh, the time to speak and, and share some of this stuff and bring some insight to people. Thanks, Dennis. And yeah, no, man. And, and, uh, thank you guys for coming on and giving me your time. I mean, this is this is I, this has been impactful, right? And this this is really like we always say that if we have two causes on the show, the main causes are you know we. we reach out to and support our veterans, um, and also new clean water, right? We don't really try to get um, too granular into politics. You know, during the last election season, I may have let a few rampant, you know, random comments neither go, but, neither, but the neither, bottom neither line we. is we don't, we don't, we're, not, we're not trying to solve any of the world's political problems, but when it comes to clean water, when it comes to the state of Florida and keeping that intact, that's really what we're all about. Everyone can agree. You know? I want little yeah. Johnny to be Connected able to get back water. in the water. Yeah. I want him to be able to get back in the water. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 I owe, and I owe it to them. I owe it to him to not have his childhood robbed, the South right. Florida waterways lifestyle robbed from him. That's been robbed from him. You know, we want we, we want his children to say, oh, we're fourth or fifth generation of Floridian. And we don't want them to leave. We don't want them to have to be like, oh, this this place is just trash. So we need to go live in, you know, North Carolina or Montana or something like that. No, we want we want Florida to be a place that flourishes for centuries to come. Right? It, it's it, important. It's really, really, really important. You know, and, and it's and I'm not saying that from a um you know, the term environmentalist has someone been somewhat been bastardized over the past few decades to mean this like, you know Are you agenda driven or are you in. action driven? Yeah. That's it, why exactly. with the environmentalists. Like like do like I, I see someone say they're an environmentalist and then throw a plastic bottle in the water. Right. You know? Or or, and, or they're and, just or they're just they're all about going to rallies and right, they're, they're, they were living that lifestyle. You know what I mean? And that it's yeah. like, no man, it's like we got we want nothing to do with that. You know, we're about coming up with tactile solutions and, and, and you know, we, we see a house that needs to be cleaned up. That's yeah. it. That's it, man. Boom. Save you know? the, help the Bahamas, take action. Help the waterways, take right. action. Help, help, you know, take action. Like, that's what I, right. like, like, don't be about words. Don't be keyboard warriors. Don't be criticizing people that are taking action. But I love, it's good to do science. Figure out what science. works. Yeah. Absolutely. And then invest in that. Don't right. just yell no, with no, no, a sign. No, you're right. You, you need the science. And, well, I, I'm lucky to have you with us, you know, and us as a team. And no, none of this would happen without Dr. Gregory's knowledge and everybody's knowledge. And uh, when I told you he was a rock star, I wasn't kidding. You could sit here for five hours talking to him about every topic you wanted. Science. Uh, <laughs> no, passion too. I've been doing the passion. I'm on the passion train. I just, you know, between the pollution and the nutrients, there's also nice. the science and the passion. And the dream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and, that's good. I'm going to raise a glass here to you guys before our SD cards run out. All right. <laughs> all right. Johnny, hey, John's got that run. look on his face yeah. like, hey. Hey, Johnny. Little well, Johnny. All right, Johnny. You're, 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 grab your empty, in, empty can. You got to cheers with us, buddy. This is about you in the future, dude. Come on. All right. Well, it's wrong way, wrong way. 
Don't do that. Let's go. All right, here you go. All right. Cheers. Hey. Cheers. Hey, to a brighter future for all of our kids in Florida. To a cleaner future. Cheers. So cleaner I got to mention future. a couple yeah. things. And uh, listen, if you're in the market for a truck or vehicle, you know you know where to go, right? You go call our good buddy, not just my good buddy, our good buddy. Our Joey's good buddy. Joey boy. Cardi, right? You can get, pick yourself up a Jeep or a nice brand new Ram Rebel like I got. They got that TRX that John over here is in love with, 702 yeah, horsepower. The thing yeah. is sick, right? Um, go see them. Listen, the, best, the best price service selection in all of South Florida if you want a Jeep Dodge Ram. Uh, Chrysler, you want one of those SVT Hemi fast car things? I'm a truck guy, so. Joe, Joey and Joey and Skip spent some time at my house in the Abacos yeah, before the hurricane. Nice, so nice. I, 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 I'm a supporter of Joey and Skip both. Yeah. They're, they're both good dudes. And if you're hungry, which I know you are, right? We got head of the to our good friends Troy and Cassie Ganther at Papa's Raw Bar, nice. right, in Lighthouse right. Point, right for the best damn. Uh, well, we got to connect by water sushi menu. Over there, the, the you guys know that the sushi menu is yes. totally what? connected by water. Yes. Sushi menu, Let's at Papa's Raw Bar, right? So, uh, and I tell you, man, those rolls were nothing to shake your head at. They're they those things they'll meaty, thick, full. They'll we're, fill you up. We're South Florida boys. We're, yeah. we're we're more the Southern boys, but we go up there and, and try and yeah. try that that spot. That's a good yeah. spot. We're, it's worth driving Point, to. If you're ever in Lighthouse Point, yeah, it's a must. You gotta go. Yeah, right? gotta go check Absolutely. it out. Right, and also remember if you're gonna hang out with your buddies and you're just gonna have a nice glass of rum, to just remind yourself to never be a spectator and enjoy some Papa's Pilar. Absolutely, every right? time. So cool. All right, we're good. Oh. um... FFMD, Fishing for Muscular Dystrophy. We got to, we're going to mention this every episode throughout to the end of the year. They have 1,500 tickets left, I think they said, something like that. They're almost sold out of all their raffle tickets. And what that means, right, is they are giving away a brand new Tremor pickup truck, fully loaded. Um, we custom wrapped all these things nice. uh, with, with in collaboration with Sainzu. Um, they're giving away a, a brand new golf cart, and they're giving away a brand new Everglades Bay Boat. Wow! In, the, in this raffle, they do wow. it every year. Right? Got to get that cart. Right? Got to get the. Got to get the. <laughs> get that tremor too. How do we find crazy. those tickets? Where do we? So you go to um, John. I'll put it up here on here. But if you search fishing for muscular dystrophy online, it's um I'm not sure the exact. You can go to ffmdraffle.org. Ffmdraffle.org, um, and go ahead and um, listen. Don't do it for the truck. Don't do it for the. Do it for the, the cause. Boat. Do it for the cause. Because listen, I can speak firsthand that. All of the money raised by this organization goes right to the kids. Awesome. Right? And the owner of the organization, you know, suffers from MD um, himself. He has that um, innate knowledge of what it's like to live with it. His sister does as well. Um, so it, it is really a life battle um, that they're trying to fight and make lives better uh, for, for these kids. So, all right. That's we awesome. good? Right? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dad. All right. Yeah, Signing absolutely. Listen, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we're always connected, connected by water. Thank by you, gentlemen, water. for coming in. All right. Thank Nailed you for it. having us, brother. Yep. Hey, Johnny, thank you for coming, being the first young young guest That's here. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>